Okay, good morning. We are now on the record at 10.05 a.m. on Monday, November 21st, 2016. Please turn off all cell phones or place them away from the microphones as they can interfere with the deposition audio. My name is Michael Fahm, Certified Legal Video Specialist with Bamford Reporting Service. Our court reporter is Kathy Nicholas, representing Bamford Reporting Service, located at 4105 North 20th Street, Suite 135, Phoenix, Arizona, 85016. This deposition is being held at 1826 North 7th Avenue, Phoenix, Arizona, in the matter of Polarin et al. versus Wagner et al. The deponent is Lynn Hart. At this time, uh, will the attorneys and all present please introduce themselves, beginning with the noticing parties. Party. Sean McMillan appearing on behalf of all plaintiffs. Joy Bertrand appearing on behalf of all plaintiffs. Daniel O'Connor appearing on behalf of defendant Deborah Harper. And James Bowen appearing on behalf of the remaining defendants. All right, thank you. Please swear in the witness. Okay, please raise your right hand. Do you swear that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me one? I do. Good morning. Can you please state and spell for us your full name? My full name is Dana Lynn Hart, D-A-N-A, -A, middle name Lynn, L-Y-N, Hart, H-A-R-T. Have you ever gone by any other names? Um, la yes, I've had a last name of Gonzalez. And how long ago was that? 15 years ago. And your mate, what's your maiden name? Wilmarth, W-I-L-M-A-R-T-H. Okay. Are you currently employed? Yes. Where? State of Arizona, Department of Child Safety. What capacity? I am the program manager for Avondale. What does that mean, program manager? What does a program manager do? The program manager is responsible for the section of that office, so I have investigation units and ongoing units um, under my direction. What's an investigation unit? Investigation unit is, I, there's three units and they have three supervisors and they're tasked to respond to all investigations that are assigned to the zip codes belonging to Avondale. Okay, three units, three supervisors. How many investigators, aside from the supervisor for that particular unit, are in each unit? Um, two units have seven, one unit has six investigators. And was that pretty much the same composition back in 2013? Correct, but I was not the program manager in 2013. Okay. What was your position in 2013? I was a supervisor for one of the investigative units. How many uh, subordinates did you supervise at that time? A uh, staff of seven, one case aide and one secretary, so nine. And uh, Ms. Wagner was one of your subordinates at that time? Correct. Going to program manager, what you do now, are you responsible in any way for ensuring that your subordinate supervisors and investigators uh, receive training? Yes. Okay. Do you know if there is any training administered relative to the constitutional rights that run between parents and children? No, I'm not aware of that. Okay. When you say that you are responsible as a program manager to ensure that your subordinates do receive training, what sort of training is it that you're responsible to make sure they receive? Our training unit and um, our upper management will offer and come up with different policy trainings or updates on things that are going on like regarding safety plans or removals, things like that, that come down to us. So when they initiate something, then I make sure it's implemented and that staff attend. Okay. And do you do something to ensure that staff actually attend? Yes, we monitor and track that. They have like a sign-in sheet or something? Sure, and it goes on a computer-based website. And are you able um, to get into that computer-based website, for example, and look at transcripts of training for particular workers to see whether or not they've actually attended specific trainings? 
I can see it for my supervisors. If I was looking for an investigator, I would have to get to the training unit, but they could find that out for me. Okay. Do you do that periodically, sort of audit to make sure that your subordinates are actually getting the training that they need to get? Yes. How frequently do you do that? As something comes down, we're aware of who's attending and who's not attending because there's makeup sessions. So it would be as frequent as something new coming out, but at least quarterly we're reviewing it and, and seeing what's going on or who's missed something, especially newer staff. As part of that process, uh, do you become familiar at all with the types of training that are being given? Yes. Okay. How long have you been a program manager? Um, it will be two years in April. So like 2014 or so? Correct. Since two, no, it'll be two years in April of 17. So oh, so it'll be 15. 15, yes. Okay. Yeah, this year went by kind of fast, kind of lost track of things. Okay. Since you became the program manager for Avondale in 2015, have you become a, aware of any um, trainings administered to your investigation workers relative to the constitutional rights that run between parents and children? No, sir. Did you undergo any sort of core training when you first became an employee? Yes, I did. When was that? The first time would have been in 1997. I was with the agency and then I left after five years and then I was gone approximately four to five years and when I came back I had to go through CORE a second time. So that would have been oh. 2002 plus, so like 2007 when you came back? Around there somewhere, yes. So your most recent CORE training would have been sometime in 2007, is that a fair estimate? It's an estimate, yes. Was it a fair estimate? It's a fair estimate. <laughs> okay. Um, now, in your core training, as part of that core training, do you recall ever being trained regarding the constitutional rights that run between parents and children? No. How about since that core training? What? Well, let me back up for a second. When you came back in 2007, underwent the, the second round of core training, what position did you hire on as? When I came back, I was an, an in-home worker, an in-home supervisor. So that's for an in-home unit that deals with in-home cases. And then I laterally transferred over to Avondale um, for ongoing and then moved into investigations. Okay, so 2007, you started as an in-home supervisor. Correct. Okay, what does that mean? What is an in-home supervisor? So an in-home is working the cases of the children left in the home and they're providing in-home services either through dependency or voluntary okay. services. So that an in-home worker then, that would be a situation where the child was not seized or detained from the custody of the parent but remained in the home just under supervision of the agency. Or it could be an in-home, yes, or an in-home dependency. What does that mean, in-home dependency? That there's enough information and evidence to support a dependency filing, but the children are allowed to leave, remain in the home. Okay. So that's the cir circumstance where you would, for example, file a petition seeking some sort of court order to do something with the family, but you leave the child with the parents? That's correct. Then ongoing, what's ongoing? What does that mean? So the ongoing units are when the children have been removed and there's an ongoing dependency and you're providing services to the family and children. Do you also have uh, ongoing services in the in-home situation? Yes. Okay, so that would, the ongoing unit would include both children that were removed, declared dependents, and that are getting services, as well as the in-home families that are getting services. Ongoing is only out of home. In-home okay. is in. That's the difference of the two. Okay. And then the investigations. Well, let me ask this before we get to investigations. Uh, is there ever a circumstance under which a worker in the in-home unit would be 
um, seizing a child from the custody of its parents? Yes. Okay. And what would be that circumstance? That something has risen to the um, level of imminent danger and the children must be removed. They are no longer safe with the parents. When you say imminent danger, what are we talking about? What does that mean? Something that rises to the level that the children cannot be left there anymore. There's, there's no availability of providing a safety monitor or something to, pro to ensure the safety of the children. Well, have you had any specific training ever regarding what is meant in the context of the work that you do by the word imminent? Yes, within the last year they've discussed imminent danger in more detail. When you say within the last year, you mean this year? This is it, yes. Okay, so 2016? Yes. Was that in a specific training or was that... There some? is specific training on the safety decision tool. What do you recall of that specific training? Um, an estimate, I mean, I'm, I don't know the formal naming, but it was about safety decision making. And what do you recall about safety decision making from this 2016 training? They, they have revamped the safety decision making tool and the training was to help staff work through it and utilize it when out in the field and looking at the safety of children. Okay, was there any difference that you recall um, between the way things were to be done prior to this new training versus the way things are to be done now? Yes, there's um, more formality with it. What do you mean more formality? Mm -hmm. It's outlined on the steps you should take when you're looking at decision making and safety decision making. Explain for me. When, when you first initially start, there's, a, there's questions you would ask somebody in the field. Um, are you or the child in imminent danger, yes or no? And so then it kind of triages out to which way you would go. Then the five safety threshold questions are asked specifically. The observable condition, what are you observing right now? What's going on? Yeah, that's one thing. Let's everybody turn off their phones. Going back to these five safety questions, do you recall what those questions are? I should. <laughs> um, the observable, is the child vulnerable? Is there any adult in the home that's able to step in and protect? And there's two more and I just can't think of them right this second. Okay. And going back to that term imminent, mm -hmm. Were you ever trained in this 2016 training or anywhere else that um, your workers, well, let me put it this way, that it would be unlawful for your workers to remove a child from its home without first obtaining a court order authorizing the removal unless at the time of the removal the worker had in their possession specific and articulable evidence to show that the child was in immediate danger of suffering severe bodily injury or death. And there's no other way to prevent that absent removing the child. Have you ever been trained that? It's a pretty long sentence there. Can you mm -hmm. go back to the very first part? Because that's... Sure. Have you, well, let's break it down. Sure. Have you ever heard in any of your trainings that in order to legally remove a child from its home, you have to have specific articulable evidence to show that the child is in immediate danger of suffering severe bodily injury or death. Yes. When did you receive that training? I think that training has been presented throughout. So I can go back through 2007 and even early on with 1997. Mm -hmm. The recent training is more specific with specific questions to try to get to that answer of that question. I'm not sure I understand. I'm sure. 
the, the new training details it out for us more clearly so that we can process through those questions. Okay, let me see if I'm understanding you. Correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the way it's set up now is there's sort of a structured decision-making tree where the, the particular investigator has to ask specific questions and the answers to those questions may or may not lead to a determination that there's this this immediate danger that the child will suffer severe bodily injury or death, right? That's correct. Okay. Before this 2016 training, there was no such decision tree function in place. It was left to the discretion of the social worker or rather the investigator and their supervisor. There was not this formal um, chart or dialogue to go with it, but the five safety threshold questions were there. It was more staffed up at that point. Um, what do you mean staffed up? So you would, as an investigator, you would staff with your supervisor. The supervisor had questions or concerns. You would staff with your then called APMs, move on up to your deputy PM, program manager, assistant director or director. It's pretty much the chain. And when you say staffed up, is that like, as if I'm an investigator out in the field, I would be consulting with these people? It would follow the chain of command, but yes, if, okay. if there was concerns or questions, absolutely. Okay. I'm just trying to clarify this staffed up. I want to make sure that what that means, at least in my mind, is that at each stage we're consulting with the next person above whatever position I'm in. Not every case would go all the way to the director's office, but mm -hmm. there are many times cases make it to one level or another. Okay. The initial decision, and this is prior to 2016, in fact, let's just target it to 2013. Okay. The initial decision to remove a child from its home, who makes that decision? It's a combination of a couple things. Um, an investigator, when they're out there, can make that decision, but they're going to be calling a supervisor and having a staffing with that and policy internally is that that's staffed with your APM as well. Okay, so if I'm, I'm say I'm an investigator, I'm out in the field investigating mm -hmm. a uh, hotline referral, mm -hmm. um, and I look around and I make the decision, I say, well, yeah, you know, looks like maybe we should remove these kids. Mm -hmm. Am I required before actually removing those kids to consult with my supervisor? Correct. Okay, and then together, my supervisor and I would discuss the issues in that consultation. Who would make the ultimate decision about whether or not to remove those children? Well, Dr. Form, calls for speculation, go ahead. I was gonna say, I hope they're coming together, but mm -hmm. if the investigator was not in agreement, it would be the supervisor's responsibility to say, you know what, then let's take this to the next level and let's see what someone else has to think about it. Okay, so if there's a situation where the supervisor and the investigator in the field are not able to consult and agree, mm -hmm. then we would go up to the, is that the APM? A it was APM at that time. Okay. okay. What do you do in a situation where, and this is again focusing on 2013, where there's not an immediate danger that the children are going to suffer severe bodily injury or death within the next few hours, but the investigator still feels like there might be some danger of some kind. How do you handle that situation? Back in 2013, how did you handle that situation? Well, it's the defini definition of investigation. You're going to keep gathering the evidence and get information that you can to find out what's going on and while you're ensuring the safety of the children at that time. Well, how do you do that? If you think that there's some kind of danger, you're not sure what it is or when it's going to manifest, how do you ensure the safety of the children while you continue your investigation? Safety plan. <coughs> and what is that? What does that mean, a safety plan? It is a, a document that formalizes an agreement between the parents and the agency and your safety monitor that there's 
an investigation going on, there's some concern, and whatever you come across that you're agreeing on, whether it's not talking about the investigation or you know whatever that looks like, that you're gonna take the child to school, whatever, that's written out in a formal document to, to calm the situation while you continue your investigation okay. while ensuring the safety of the children. You ever have a circumstance in your entire career with the agency, you ever have a circumstance where you have one of these safety plans and the parents just say, no, I'm not gonna sign off on that? Yes. Okay. What, what do you do in that circumstance where the parent or caregiver just says, no, I'm not gonna sign your safety plan? And then you have to have that open discussion about the safety of the children and whether it rises to the level of removal or not or if it's something you can walk away with. When you say open discussion, open discussion with who? Well, as a supervisor, I wouldn't be including my APM, but definitely with the investigator as well and anyone else associated with the case. Okay. Have you ever been yourself a um, investigator as opposed to an investigative supervisor? Or yes, super sir. When, when did you do that? When I first started in 97. I was an investigator for four years. Okay. Did you ever have, uh, in those four years, did you ever have a situation where the parent just said, no, I'm not gonna sign your safety plan? Yes. Okay. And how did you typically react to that? Again, looking at what the situation is, you know, is it something I can walk away from or is it something I need to get further clarification or discussion regarding the safety of the children? Okay. Is there a procedure or a policy in place that you know of and we can start with currently, that requires a investigator to go get a court order to remove the children if the parents won't sign off on a safety plan? There's no policy that we're told about that has to do with that, no. Do you have any policy or procedure in place by which uh, any of your subordinate staff would go about obtaining a warrant to remove a child? No. Do you know of any circumstances under which a warrant might be required before you can remove a child from the custody of its parents? Can you clarify? When I hear the word warrant, we don't deal with warrants. Um, we have filed pickup orders. Pickup orders. What's a pickup order? A pickup order is if you if you have a situation with a child that's out on the streets and is at harm or something, the police have been notified and so on and so forth, but say that child cannot return to the parent's home, you would file a pickup order so if the child is found, they come to the care of the DCS. Okay, let me make sure I understand. So if you have a child that's maybe run away or it's, uh, you know, out on the street, maybe AWOL from foster care or something like that, then you would go to court, get a pickup order, and transmit that somehow to law enforcement? Correct. Okay, and then they would keep an eye out for the child, and if they found him, they'd bring him back. Right. Okay. Is there any other circumstance that you know of um, where a pickup order would be required to remove a child from the custody of its parents? There has been a pickup order filed along with a dependency petition if the parents have absconded, if they're if they can't be located and it's thought that the children are in danger. Um. So this is where I'm having a little bit of confusion. Okay. And maybe you can help me out. If we have a situation, I'm out in the field and I investigate, and I say, well, you know, based on history, there might be some danger to the children here, but it's not necessarily immediate. So let's try and get them into a safety plan. You with me so far? Mm -hmm. And the parent says, no, I'm not going to sign that. Is there some, something you can do as the investigator to ensure the safety of the child? Well, you know, and not invade the rights of the parents and the children you know, to stay together. Well, as a compound and also as an incomplete hypothetical, go ahead and answer as best you can. Um, you would, we try to educate our investigators to where they're gonna have a 
relationship or to establish a relationship to where we don't typically run into that. You want to work with the families. Our goal is to try to keep families together. If the child's unsafe, the child's unsafe. If it rises to that level, then you have to do what you have to do to ensure the safety of that child. Including remove the child from the parent's custody. Sometimes. And when we're talking about that child, the assessment of whether or not that child's safe, doesn't that include a time element? Like the child's not safe immediately before we remove? It could. Now, doing the work that you do, you're required to have some working understanding of the law, correct? Of state statute, yes. Well, let me ask you this. You understand in our system of government, there's, there's basically two bodies of law, right? One is federal, one is state. You understand okay. that? Yes. And you get training on that? I don't know if they ever, I, I don't remember in training hearing about federal law or something of that sort. State statute is what we look at, the state policy that's in front of us. Do you recall ever being trained that the 14th Amendment in the United States Constitution protects the um, associational interests between parents and children? No, sir. Have you ever been trained that the 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution mandates that before a child be removed or seized from the custody of its parents, the seizing government agent must have specific articulable evidence to show that the child is in immediate danger of suffering severe bodily injury or death. To answer the part about the federal law, no. I know okay. that we discuss that in our state statute before removing. Okay. And your testimony here today is that you don't recall ever having any training relative to the protections afforded the relationship between parents and children under the United States Constitution? Am I understanding you correctly? When it's termed under like Constitution law or anything, okay. no. All right, I'm gonna show you. I'm sorry, I don't cop. It's okay. If at any point you need a break or need to drink water or whatever, that's fine, just let me know. I'm gonna show you what will mark as exhibit number 84 um, to your deposition. And we can pass this around. I only have one. We'll let her look at it. And okay. You... And if you guys can go off the record real quick, I'm going to go downstairs and get a bottle of water if anybody else wants one. The time is 10.32 a.m. off the record. And while we were on break, you had an opportunity to uh, review exhibit numbers 84 and 85, correct? Correct. Well, let's start with exhibit number 84. Do you recognize that document? I don't recognize it per se as a document. Um, it, the information is all familiar. Um, it looks like it's part of PowerPoints that may have been in different trainings or in core but as a whole, I don't necessarily rec recognize it. Okay, and just so that the record is clear, the first page, bottom right-hand corner, is numbered. That's page number one. Can you mm -hmm. flip to the last page of the document? Let me know that number. 27. 27. So let me just make sure I'm clear and understand what you're saying is you haven't necessarily yourself seen this PowerPoint presentation, but you're familiar with the information contained in it. That's fair. Okay. Do you recall when it was you first became familiar with the information contained in exhibit number 84? I would believe it was when I was first hired, so back in 97. Okay. If I can get you, there's a couple pages. Uh, Actually, they may not be dog-eared on yours. Hold on. Let me. Yeah, if you can turn to page 19. Okay. Where it says court orders at the top there. And uh, in big, bold letters, it says always comply with a court order. If you're unable to comply with or disagree with order, contact AG to discuss filing 
and then it gives us two bullet points, a motion to vacate or modify, mm -hmm. or an appeal. Mm -hmm. did, I, did I read all that correctly so far? Yes. Okay. And then down at the bottom, again in big bold letters, all caps, it says, even if AG files a motion or appeal, you must still make good faith effort to comply unless court vacates or modifies the order or order is stayed or suspended during an appeal. Did I read all that correctly? Yes. Okay. Is that the uh, general understanding that you have had with respect to complying with court orders or the requirement to comply with court orders since you were initially hired in 1997? Yes. Okay. Are there any exceptions to this rule? No, except no. If if there's a concern, you could file a motion to reconsider, but you would not disobey a court order. Is there any circumstance you can think of under which it would be appropriate for you to disobey a court order? No. So basically, unless there's a stay or the order suspended or an appellate court reverses the order, you you comply with that order. Yes. And that's a requirement. Yes. Under the law. Yes. According to your training? Yes. What's the penalty if you don't? I don't know. If you can turn to the next page, it's page number, actually I don't see a page number, it looks like there was a 20 underneath the little policeman in the bottom right hand corner. I see a little zero there anyway, it says contempt. Should be right after page 19. Nope, no contempt. You're missing contempt. Well, here, you know what? Are we, we going to want to modify that exhibit and well, I think make the, a copy and add that to it? Or? I think that one of the things uh, happening here, there's a sticker on mine that says uh, that I guess this was produced um, as a supplemental, I guess the next page was missing from the original production, page 20, and it was produced as a supplemental response. So let me do this. Let's take another break. I apologize. And let me run downstairs and make a copy of the contempt page, and we'll modify it. Well, I'm going to need to ask for questions about it. So. I was 1044 in the end. Okay, I apologize for the little uh, break there. We were missing the next page, and I asked you to turn to it. It just wasn't there, so we've corrected that problem. And uh, now there is a page in exhibit number 84 that bears a heading of contempt, correct? Correct. And are you familiar with that concept that's depicted there on that yes, page? Yes, I am. Okay. You see here where contempt of court, it tells us, is a knowing or intentional non-compliance with a court order. Did I read that right? Yes. And is that consistent with your training and understanding? Yes. And that in order to be held in contempt, the person must have knowledge of the court order and also have the ability to comply with the court order. Am I right about that? Correct. Okay. Have you ever been held in contempt? No. Have any of your uh, subordinates ever been held in contempt? Not that I'm aware of, no. Have any of your subordinates, to your knowledge, ever uh, refused or failed to comply with a court order? Um, there have been situations with ongoing cases to where services were ordered and they couldn't be provided, and so we would have a motion to show cause. Um, It wasn't a personal contempt, it was something that couldn't be provided and we had to get before the judge to dis discuss it. Is there, has there ever been a circumstance where one of your subordinates has actually been ordered to appear in court to show cause why that particular person did not comply with a court order? Yes. Okay, how frequently does that happen? Um, with my experience as a program manager, my ongoing case managers see that a little more frequently, mm -hmm. um, mostly because of the services and the issues with financial budgets and stuff like that. Okay. What about a circumstance uh, 
where the court orders the return of a child to its parents. Have you ever seen that circumstance where the court orders that a child be returned to its home and your workers refuse to comply? Where they refuse? Form. Assumes facts, go ahead. Where they've refused, no. Okay. How about just where they failed to comply? They didn't return the kid when ordered. No, if we're ordered, we would, I don't know of a situation where we would not do that. Exhibit number 33 to your deposition. Okay. And I'm going to pass it around to counsel first. It's titled Case Notes. Looking at that, it bears Bates numbers AZ hyphen CPSF 000140 through 141. Do you recognize that document? I do. What is case notes? What is that? The case notes are the place within our system which is called Childs that any any documentation is going on, you, you would enter it into child's case notes would reflect conversations or, you know, events, happenings, paperwork. Okay. How about the substance of interviews? If an investigator goes out and interviews witnesses, would that get put into case notes? They could be. But they're not required to be? There would be a requirement to document it if, if it happened after the CSRA was completed. So if something subsequently happened, yes, they would enter it in a child case note. Okay. And do you recall some training where your workers, and perhaps even you were trained, that if it's not documented, it didn't happen? Yes. Okay. So we should be able to, according to policy and training, look at the case notes and the CSRA together and see everything that happened in the case documented? Well, the, the CSRA would be its own entity. It wouldn't necessarily be duplicated into child's case notes. Okay, but it, that was my question, is taken together. If I have both the CSRA and the case notes. You would have your story that would continue on into child's case notes, yes. Okay. So the case notes happen after the CSRA is completed? Yes. 
<clears throat> and when we um, have that training that says if it's not documented, it didn't happen, is that applied to both the CSRA and the case notes? It should, yes. Are those the only places where we would document events in a case? A court report. But the court report is more or less taken from the substance of the CSRA and the case notes, correct? Correct. So even without a court report, it should be documented in that body somewhere between the CSRA and the case notes? Correct. Okay. So if we see something that appears in the court report, but not in the case notes or the CSRA, what do we make of that? It's not best practice. Why would it not be best practice? Because you should be documenting what you're, the conversations you're having and whatever information's coming forth. Okay. And when we create one of these case notes, who, who actually does it? Who authors the case notes? Anybody that's part of the case. Any, I could get into a case and put a case note in. Okay. As a general practice or is there a policy? That's a better question. Is there a policy that requires that the information put into case notes by whoever's authoring a case note be truthful, honest, accurate, and complete? My answer is yes. I don't know what the policy is. I don't know where I would find it, but yes, ethically and everything, absolutely. And when you were a supervisor, um, the sort of training that your subordinates would get, it'd be, it'd be formalized training like what we've seen here with the PowerPoints and things like that, mm -hmm. right? Right. But there would also be informal sort of coaching or mentoring, correct? Correct. And you yourself as a supervisor would, would do that with your subordinates, correct? Yes. Was it your practice to teach your subordinate workers that when they're documenting information in the case notes, they're to be truthful, honest, accurate, and complete? Yes. Okay. Does the same hold true with respect to the CSRA, that in documenting events in the CSRA, the author is to be truthful, honest, accurate, and complete? Yes. Okay. Is there a penalty if they're not? They could receive formal discipline for it, yes. Have you, in your entire time with the agency, have you ever heard of a worker being disciplined in any way for being dishonest in their case notes? Yes. How frequently does that happen? That's a hard number to, to quantify. Um, I would think not often, but I have seen workers disciplined for it. I have disciplined workers for it. As a program manager or as a supervisor? As a supervisor. How many times as a supervisor did you discipline workers for being dishonest in case notes? Off the top of my head, I can think of three or four instances that led to some pretty serious situations. Do you know whether or not uh, as a result of that dishonesty in case notes, um, parents lost custody of their children? No. If you don't know, that's no, fine. No, I don't. I, on the circumstance that I'm thinking of, no. Okay. What about with respect to dishonesty in the CSRA? Have you ever um, yourself disciplined or heard of a worker being disciplined for being dishonest in their CSRA? Not, no. Okay. How about with, let's talk a little bit about the petition. Do you, okay. You know what a petition is? Yes, sir. Okay. Can you describe for us what a petition is? It's the document, the court document that we file with the court when we're filing for um, either in home or out of home care. Is that the document that basically initiates a court proceeding? Yes. Do you know? Well, let me clarify. It's okay. a document that goes to the AG so that they can review it and they file for the petition. We don't do that. Okay. They actually file it, but your staff would... This is the worksheet for it. Okay. Your, your staff would put together the worksheet. Correct. And then the AG would actually put together the, the allegations. Yes. Okay. Then they send it back to your staff to get a... Verification. Verification under penalty of perjury, right? Yes. Okay. And is it your understanding that the reason that 
that verification, well, let me ask you this first, that verification of the penalty of perjury, it's required by law, right? Yes. And in fact, if it's not obtained, then the petition is defective on its face, correct? I believe so. Okay. The purpose of that verification is to ensure that the information contained in the petition is also truthful, honest, accurate, and complete, correct? Yes. Okay. And when we say complete, that means that we include um, exculpatory information, correct? Yes. Okay. And have you received training regarding that term, exculpatory? What does exculpatory information mean? We have not received training on that word, but we do discuss gathering of evidence or supporting documents or facts or whatever that pertains to that case. What's your understanding of what exculpatory information means? That it's the information that would, it's almost opposite of, of what's happened, but it's the bringing in of information that unsupports it. Okay. So for example, it's, it's information that would undermine or negate the allegations in the petition, right? Objection to form assumes facts. Go ahead. I'm sorry? I'm, I'm just making an objection. You can go oh, ahead. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> Do you need the question reread? Sure. Can I get the question reread, please? So for example, it's information that would undermine or negate the allegations in the petition, right? That's my understanding, okay. to the best of my knowledge. And you also have an understanding, don't you, that your workers are under an affirmative obligation, an affirmative legal obligation to provide the court with the exculpatory information. Objective form, assumes facts. Also, maybe foundation, I'm not sure. Join. Do you need a rewriting? No, you want me to answer? <laughs> Sorry, I can't keep up with all that. Oh. It's all right, it's all right. Let's just get it reread so we're all clear. And you also have an understanding, don't you, that your workers are under an affirmative obligation, an affirmative legal obligation to provide the court with the exculpatory information. Correct. Okay. Did you learn that in training? I don't know about specifically in training, but just throughout working with the, the AGs through the dependency cases that I've done. Mm -hmm. How many dependency cases do you think you've done? Over, let, let's exclude for a moment um, as a program manager. So I think as a program manager, you no longer have direct involvement. Is that right? Not direct. Okay. So let's just restrict it to where you would have some kind of direct involvement in the bringing or prosecution of a dependency case? Just a rough estimate. How many do you think you've done in your career? I can't, I would have no idea. Over a hundred, maybe more than that. Well, back when you were a supervisor and you had, I don't recall, was it six or seven people under you? Okay. Was it six or seven? I don't Should remember I, the number. I had seven. Seven. Back when you were a supervisor, um, you, you would be made aware of um, your subordinates filing of petitions or the creation of petition worksheets, right? Yes. Okay. Roughly how many a month of those would you see? It's hard to answer. Um, You could have a quiet month with none, and you could have a busy month with 30. I, I don't have anything to su So you don't have like an average off the? As a supervisor, I would say between five and 10 petitions a month, but like I said, it could really vary depending on the month and the amount of kids per petition. Okay. And then in the uh, investigation units, I think you said how many investigation units were there? At, when I was a supervisor? Yeah. The three. Three, right. And uh, I think you said that two of them had seven and one had six or Correct. something like that, mm -hmm. right? Do you know whether the other supervisors of those other two units were seeing more or less the same sort of workflow in terms of petitions filed? I would say it would be the same. Okay. 
So would a fair estimate be somewhere between 10 and 20 a month for the entire, um, you call them regions? Well, when you were asking me, that would have been for my unit. Mm -hmm. So to say that all three units were doing that, then that would triple that number. And okay. That's, so I just, like 15 I just don't to 30. It's like 15 to 30, something like that. Yeah. It's hard. Okay. Sure. It's an estimate. I, sure. I don't know. Well, now, as program manager, um, do you have any responsibility to, to keep track of the workflow for your area? Workflow is meaning investigations or are you petitions. talking about petitions? Petitions. Yes. I'll, all removals are staffed with me. Okay. All removals are staffed all with All removals. Me. How many removals a month do you do right now? Or how many re removals a month are your subordinates mm -hmm. doing right now, on average? Well, we track numbers by children, and we're removing typically about 20 to 22 children a month. So that could be 22 separate petitions, or it could be two petitions with a large amount of children. I got it. And I'm correct, aren't I, that uh, you guys do not get pickup orders or warrants or court orders of any kind um, to remove these children. These would all be children that were removed from their parents based on your investigator or supervisor's impressions. Correct. Has that number 20 to 22 per month remained consistent pretty much the whole time that you were program manager or that you've been program manager? Like I said, some we have quiet months that there's nothing going on and then there's high volume times right before school, right after the holidays that numbers go higher. Okay. Okay. Going back for a moment to um, what we were talking about a little bit earlier regarding when, you know, court orders something be done, that you're supposed to follow that court order. Remember that testimony earlier? Yes. If you can take a look back at exhibit number 33, and uh, down at the bottom of the page there, there's an email from Karen Wagner. I think we talked about this, but we can just make sure. Karen Wagner was your subordinate back in June of 2013. Is that correct? Correct. And if you look at the email at the bottom there of the page on base number AZCPSF000140, you see an email, or I guess part of an email string there. It's Karen Wagner to Gene Burns. You see that? I do. Do you know who Gene, Gene Burns is? He was our program manager at the time. So at that point in time, he was uh, fulfilling the position I'm, that you're in now? He was, is that right? Program, he was the program manager, yeah. yeah. Sorry. So that's the same position you have now, right? The, wor the wordings were different back then. Uh, they changed our titles within the last few months. So back then, we had an assistant program manager, a deputy program manager, and then the program manager. His position today is called a program administrator. What's the difference between a program administrator and a program manager? Nothing. They've just changed the titles. Changed the name, okay. So now the title would be program manager. He, he today would be in a program administrator. What are you today? I'm a program manager. What's the difference? I have an office. He has the entire region. So for our region, it's six offices. Okay. Okay, so what, what do we call now the person that um, would have the entire region? The program administrator. Okay, I got it. Had me confused a little bit. And it's then the, confusing. Then the program manager manages one subsection of that region. Correct. Okay. And your Avondale is your subsection? Correct. How many subsections are there in the region? In our region, there's six. That's the southwest region. Do you know that's southwest region? You Correct. Say? 
Do you know, um, aside from Avondale, what are the other? Yes, there's the 101 office. There's Glendale, Peoria, Thunderbird, Pinnacle Peak, and Yuma. And we don't always count them, but that's actually seven. Why do you guys not count them? We don't think of them when we're talking about Maricopa County. And I got you, because they're different yeah. county altogether, right? Wow. <laughs> Is that going to be an issue on the uh, sound? Um, it'll work. Oh. That, I can't control that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Well, this under act of God. Yeah. <laughs> is, is it normal for somebody in the position of a program administrator to be getting involved in a particular case? Yes. That is a normal event? Doesn't happen every day, but it does happen, yes. Okay. And under what circumstances would that normally happen? Uh, extenuating circumstances that aren't of the norm, um, severe fatality, injury, um, high profile cases that have made the news. Or a uh, directive to disobey a court order, would that be an extenuating circumstance? That could be a yes. I thought the training though, wasn't the training fairly um, explicit that we don't disobey court orders, even if we disagree with them. That's my understanding, yes. So, and I asked you earlier, is there an exception to that rule, that we follow court orders? I believe that you said there's not, but has that opinion changed? Not Check that. the form. Ask and answer, go ahead. Not to my knowledge. Okay, and looking at exhibit number 33, the bottom of the page there, um, Karen Wagner's writing to Gene Burns and then some other people. Do you recognize these other names here under the CC line? I do. Who is Jacqueline Cirasoni? Cirasoni, she was a supervisor, an investigative super, super, supervisor along with me. Why was she being CC'd on this, if you know? My understanding is on this date, I was not in the office. I wasn't present, and so she was, well, Sharon Canick was my supervisor and she was CC'd and I later learned that maybe she wasn't there, I don't know, and that's why Jackie got brought in. Okay. Okay. And Lynn Hart, that's you, who's Jeanette Bell? Jeanette Bell was our deputy program manager back then, so that position's no longer here, but that would have been the person in between my role today and the program administrator, we used to have a middle person in there. Okay. Well, what Ms. Wagner says is, um, and I'll just skip to the second paragraph there. It says, I am just confirming that I am to serve a TCN to the family and not return the children. We will be filing a special action request and you are giving me permission to violate the court order not to return the children. First, did I read that correctly? You did. Um, at some point in time, I understand you weren't there that the day this happened, but at some point in time, did you read this email? Yes. And do you remember when? Um, probably the following week. Is, that's a guess. I'm not sure. Positive. When you read this email, were you? Did you have some concern that? your subordinate was not following a court order? Yes, there was concern. Why? Why were you concerned about Ms. Wagner not following the court's order? Object four, Ms. Tate. Assumes facts. Join. I was concerned about what had happened. I didn't know. So at this point I was trying to find out what the events were that took place. Well, at some point did you pull up the court's minute order? No, I talked to my chain of command to get 
the events of what happened. Why would you not just go look at the court's minute order? I don't know. I wanted to hear what had happened okay. firsthand. And what did, well, let's ask this first. Who did you talk to first? It would be a guesstimate, mm -hmm. but my first thought would be I would talk to Sharon Canick, as she was my direct supervisor, along with Karen Wagner, and say, what happened here? And possibly Jackie, too, since she was in on it, on the emails. Okay. Would those conversations have been documented somewhere? They should have been. Okay, sort of like this email chain was documented, even though it's internal communications, correct? Correct. Where would you normally document if you went and talked to um, Sharon and Karen and Jackie to find out what the basis of this? Um, it would have been in child's case notes under a supervision um, title. Now, these child's case notes, as far as you know, that's contained in the computer system permanently, right? Correct. So if we were to ask her for those case notes to be produced, it should be a simple matter to just print them and produce them. You have to form some facts, go ahead. If you know. If the notes were in there, yes. Okay. Sitting here today, uh, well, we know that the general rule is if it's not documented, it didn't happen, right? Right. So sitting here today, do you have a recollection of actually putting into the case notes these conversations that you believe you had with Sharon, Karen, and Jackie? I do not. Okay. What do you recall learning of those, from those conversations? So my understanding was that there had been a court hearing and the dependency had been dismissed and it was elevated all the way up to the director's office and the director gave the direction to serve a second TC or to serve a TCN. And who was the director at that time who gave that order? Deb Harper. Did you follow up with Deb Harper to find out why it was she thought it was appropriate to not follow the court order? No. Did you ever speak with anybody to find out why it was Deb Harper thought it was okay? to violate the court order. Do you have to inform the states and assume facts? Join. The chain of command was to go through my supervisor, which was Sharon, and at some point, I know Jeanette Bell was brought into that conversation. Um, I wouldn't have went any higher at that point when, with the direction that they were giving me. Did you play any role at all on June 13th in making this decision to, as Ms. Wagner put it in her email, to violate the court order? I did not. Did you recall the date when you first discovered this uh, direction um, to Ms. Wagner to use her language to violate the court order? I do not. Answered. I don't know the date. At any point in time, did you voice any objection to anybody about this decision uh, to violate the court order? There was definitely conversation mm -hmm. about what the agency was doing and the direction we were headed. What do you mean? Well, it's not often that your director gets involved in deciding that a TCN would or would not be served. So having said that, we were like, okay, for our position of where we're at in, in the chain of this, what are we doing next? What, what are you looking at for services? Where are we headed with this? What's, you know, what's the plan? So we were looking for direction with that. Can I get my question reread, please? The one before the immediate last one. At any point in time, did you voice any objection to anybody about this decision to violate the court order? 
that's my question, ma'am. At any point in time, did you yourself voice any objection to anybody in your chain of command about the decision to violate this court order? Objection form misstates and assumes facts. Join. I don't recollect saying I object. I recollect questioning it and asking about it, but I can't go on record and say I objected or was going to go against the direction of my superiors. In fact, if you had gone against the direction of your superiors, that might have gotten you some discipline as being insubordinate, right? Object to form foundation. Join. Join. I don't think I was concerned about that. I just understood that the decision had been made. What specifically about this direction, uh, to use Ms. Wagner's terms, to violate the court order, what specifically about it did you question? Karen Wagner is a good investigator and to be in court and to hear that that it was dismissed or, or to return the children and to have people from up above and your superiors tell you to disregard it. She was clearly putting things in writing to, to cover herself. Miss Wagner was? Yes. Did you talk to her about that? Yes. And what'd she tell you? Just run me through that conversation. It's quite a while ago. So no, I, I understand. <laughs> Just the same concerns I did. Um, you know, we have a court order, and we were told not to, you know, not to obey it. And so, what does that do with us being, quote unquote, the people down at ground level of this? Do you recall roughly when it was that you had this conversation with Miss Wagner? Whenever I return back from being gone, I, I don't have those dates. So probably a week or so after June 13th, would that be a fair estimate? It's a guess, yes. Were you on vacation or something, or do you recall? I do not remember. I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Okay. Was Ms. Wagner the first person that you spoke with after you reviewed this email? I, I believe so. Okay. How long was that conversation? Probably not too long because I know that she was concerned and upset and I needed to find out more about what had happened and get an understanding of what the agency's position was. And was it in this conversation that uh, you learned that the reason she wrote this email was sort of like a CYA? That's how I interpreted it. Okay. And basically what we mean by that is to, uh, you know, cover her from any disciplinary proceeding or something that may come about as a result of her not following the court order. Objection Foundation assumes facts. Go ahead. Join. Just that it had happened and she wanted it in black and white as to what her direction had been. Mm -hmm. Was there anything else that the two of you discussed in this conversation that you recall? At that time was to get the case ready for the ongoing and to get it wrapped up from the investigation piece of it. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but you have the ability to actually file something with the court to get a court order to detain a child, right? If you wanted to do that, if you wanted to get a court order, your agency has the ability to file a motion or a document of some kind with the court to get an order to detain that child. Objection, foundation, go ahead. Yes. What do we call that? What do we call that process? Well, you could file the dependency petition. Anything else? How about a request for a pickup order? Yes, if you're looking for the yes. I was thinking along the lines of like 
when we get PDPs that are, it's the same format. PDP, what's a PDP? Um, as soon as you said that, I lost it. <laughs> Sorry. Private dependency petition. Uh, say it again? Private dependency petition. What is that? It's when an, an attorney or another party will go to the courts and file a petition asking that we be put in, subbed in to the case due to safety concerns with the child. Okay. What about uh, like a removal order? Do you guys have anything? Do you have anything like that? A what? A removal order? A removal order. Yeah, where you get an order from a court permitting you to remove a child? That would be like a pickup order. Okay. All right. Yeah, we use different terms. I, I'm from California and they use different terms out there than you guys use here. It sounds like it's more or less the same thing. What's the process for obtaining a pickup order? Um, you would file, well, if you're, there's two different ways to look at it. A pickup order could be used for a child that's already a ward of the state, mm -hmm. so there's that way. Or if you're looking at it in the sense of a new petition, you would file the, the worksheet, the petition, along with the pickup order and send it before the judge to determine if the judge is in agreement. Okay. And how long does it typically take to get a uh, request for a pickup order put together? Um, a good day, 24 hours, um, bad 48 to 72 working hours. Okay. And when we're talking about um, 24 to 72 hours, does, is that 24 to 72 hours from the point in time that you decide? to seek a pickup order to the point it gets issued? That would be the time we've sent it to the AG and they're typing it up and getting it to the judge. Okay. And typically, if you know, once you've provided what you need to provide to the AG to get something put together for the judge, uh, how long does it typically take before you get back a order one way or the other from the judge? Well, I know now when we're filing petitions, they have to be filed that's once a TCN is served, we have a time frame. I don't know if there's a time frame of when they have to be filed. I'm not aware of that. If we file, if we have a TCN and we're filing a petition, it has to be filed within 72 hours. Is there any process that you know of where um, <laughs> your workers can actually call in to a judge to get sort of like a, an emergency pickup order? No. Is there any such thing as an emergency pickup order? Not that I'm aware of. I've seen um, a pickup order rushed through, like kind of walked through over to the judge's chamber or what have you, but not, mm -hmm. not something more formalized that I could do or anything. And when it's walked through like that, to use your phrase, how long does that typically take before you get, from the time that you start working on the paperwork to the time that you get the order issued? How long does that take? Again, I would say between 24 and 48 hours, depending on the time that it's filed. Okay. Now going back to this uh, exhibit number 33, if you know, would it have been possible to go back into the judge and seek a, or walk through a new pickup order? Objection form foundation. Join. I believe it's possible. Okay, and if they walked it through, it would have taken somewhere between 24 and 48 hours? Possibly. Okay. According to your current training, your 2016 training, Instead of not following the court order, would it have been appropriate to walk through a new pickup order, seek a new order from the judge? Form foundation. Join. There's possibly two parts to that. Is it possible? It's possible. Um, but was the direction given on what to do by upper management? It was. So. Let me make sure I'm understanding this. Once a clear direction is given by upper management, then you no longer have discretion to do something else. You just follow the directive. Object forms, assumes facts. Join. I want to say I believe that to be true, 
um, if I had an, well, I guess there's ifs in there, but yes, I believe that to be true. And looking up the email chain on uh, exhibit number 33, page number 140, we have a responsive email from Mr. Burns directly to Karen Wagner, correct? You see that? It's on the, the first, this is the page number down here. Okay. So it would be like right in here. Oh, I see it's kind of blended in there. Yes, yeah. I see it. And uh, we see some other people on there, right? We see this Carolyn. Moreski. Moreski. Mm -hmm. And Laura mm -hmm. Giacinto. Mm -hmm. Do you know who they are? Carolyn Moreski was a... I believe in the turn AAG's, um, I believe she was in a supervision level, but I don't know Laura. Okay, and then uh, in the substance, the body of his email, um, Mr. Burns tells Ms. Wagner, yes, serve the TCN. This has been cleared with Deb Harper as well as the director's office. Should you run into any problems, call me on my cell. And then he gives a cell number. Did I read that correctly? Yes, sir. At some point in time, I, I noticed you were also on the CC list. At some point in time, do you recall reading this? It would have been at the same time when I returned back from my time off. Okay. And I see that uh, the time stamp for when Mr. Burns' responsive email was sent. It was 6.15 p.m. Do you see that? Yes. Did you ever talk to anybody about um, how long it took to make the decision to not follow the court's order? Check the form, assumes facts, misstates facts. Join. I did not have that conversation, no. Okay. Then up above um, Mr. Burns's responsive email, there's a paragraph there. It says, a temporary custody hearing was held on June 13th, 2013. Judge Grant dismissed the dependency based on lack of jurisdiction. The AG's office has filed a special action appeal and it is being heard before the courts today on June 14th, 2013, in the Court of Appeals. On June 13th, 2013, Judge Grant ordered that the children be returned to parents. The department decided in the best interest of the children that CPS will not return the children to parents and will serve a new TCN. First of all, did I read that correctly? Yes. Do you know who authored that? Karen Wagner. Okay, and you know that because it says that two lines above under author. Yes. Note, where the notes created. Now going back to that training we were talking about earlier in exhibit number 84, doesn't it tell us that even if you're going to appeal, you still must, you must still make a good faith effort to comply with the court order unless the court vacates or modifies the order or the orders stay. Isn't that the training? Yes. Do you have any understanding? Well, let me ask you this. Do you know whether or not on June 14th, Judge Grant's order was stayed? No. I don't, I don't know how that all came about, no. Do you know whether or not any good faith effort to comply with Judge Grant's order was ever undertaken? Check the form foundation. Go ahead. Join. I don't know. Do you have any understanding why it was that uh, Judge Grant's order was not followed. Check foundation misstates fact. I don't know. 
do you know whether or not Judge Grant's order was followed? To return the children, it was not. Okay. That's what I thought, but we have to address the objections, so there you go. Now, as far as you know, everybody knew about Judge Grant's order, right? Yes. Okay. And the way they knew about it is because they got documentation on it, right? Yes. Your agency had the ability on June 13th, 2013 to comply with Judge Grant's order, didn't it? Yes. As far as you know, did the agency ever apply to Judge Grant to either vacate the order or stay it? To form foundation. I don't know what the AG did or did not do. Okay. Who would know that? Well, Keller, Car Carolyn Moreski's on here, so I would think she would be a party to that. Okay. And I would also think that Deb Harper, being the director, they she would have had some conversation with the AGs. Mm -hmm. Did you, if you recall, did you ever yourself follow up to determine whether or not a motion to vacate or stay Judge Grant's order had ever been filed? No, I did not. Going back now to the very beginning, because we sort of got ahead of ourselves, um, do you recall when it was that this family first came to your attention? I believe it was in April of 2013. What do you recall on that? That we received a report that was assigned to Karen Wagner. And tell me the process when, when one of your subordinates or when you get a report in, are you involved at all in assigning the investigation out to your subordinates? Sometimes. Okay, but not always? Not always. Okay, do you remember whether or not you were involved in any way in assigning this investigation to Karen Wagner? I don't recall. Okay. What do you recall of the allegations in the report? What I recall is that a family had come to Arizona in our zip code, having been in Japan. Um, and there was concerns about some possible abuse and neglect in Japan and possible current abuse and neglect going on at that time. Okay, and what's the first thing that you recall in terms of the investigation into those allegations? As I was giving it to Ms. Wagner, or um, just in the process, if you recall assigning it to Miss Wagner, we'll start there. If you don't recall anything other than maybe a phone call from Miss Wagner, that's where we'll start. It's whatever you remember. And I recall that the military was involved and to remind her to get a hold of them because we work cohesively with them, and that um, at some point. I would have to remember if there was a criminal conduct, a CC identifier with the report, because I know Buckeye PD was involved, but I don't know if it was because there was an identifier attached to the report. Okay, what's the first contact that you recall having um, with Ms. Wagner relative to this particular investigation? Um, I remember her calling that evening sometime as she was at the house and the family was having dinner and they would not let her nor the detective speak with them and so she was saying that they were going to be out there for a while. So let me make sure I've got this clear is uh, Miss Wagner told you on the phone that the family would not let the detectives speak with them? She said she was there with the detective and that they did not want to speak to her. They were having dinner and that she was going to wait until they were through with dinner. 
and that when this whole episode of her having to wait until they were through with dinner, when that happened, as she told you, a detective was present for that? It seems like she did, but I could be wrong. Maybe the detective showed up later. I'm not clear. I, I don't okay. remember the specifics. Do you recall Miss Wagner interviewing one of the children at school? I do remember her telling me about that, yes. Okay, what do you remember her telling you? Mm, that the female child was very hesitant to speak with her, that she relayed that she's not allowed to talk about what happened in Japan, that she talked a little bit about what their lifestyle was like, that mommy is the one that spanks, she uses a wooden spoon, that daddy doesn't spank, and that she was afraid she was going to be in trouble for talking to Karen. Do you know whether or not there were police present at the school interview? I don't. I don't know. I don't remember specifically when the police came in and when they did not. I don't know. Do you recall whether or not Ms. Wagner um, called you on the phone either before, during, or after the school interview? I don't recall after the school. I recall when she was at the house waiting. Do you recall the priority assigned to this particular investigation? No, I would have to look at it to remember. Okay. Off the top of your head, do you know what the response time, the required response time for a priority four? Um, Seven, Seven days. Seven mm days. -hmm. Is a priority four referral cons uh, considered an emergency referral? Not if you're equating it like a P1 that you need to be out there within two hours, no. And part of the reason um, that you're allowed to have seven days instead of two hours on a P4 is because the allegations are not of immediate abuse or immediate physical harm, correct? Correct. Is it ever appropriate for a investigator out in the field to tell a parent that if they don't sign a safety plan, their kids will be taken and put in foster care? It, it's not appropriate to make a directive as such. There could be a conversation of some of the situations and what we're trying to achieve. What do you mean when you say it would be a conversation? What do you mean? So if you were with a family and you had some concerns and you're speaking with them and saying, you know, we have an investigation we need to do, there's steps that have to be taken in the meantime to, to not have your child go stay with somebody strange or in foster care or anything like that. Is there anything else we can come up with? Is there any other adult that can come in and help monitor the situation for the time being. So basically you're giving the parent an option, either the child goes to foster care or can go somewhere else, just not in your care. You're trying to... That would depend on the specific case. It could be that on some situations and it, it could not be. Okay. Well, in this particular case, do you know whether or not Ms. Wagner gave these parents, the Pellerins, that option? Either the children go to foster care or they go somewhere else, just not in your care. I do know that the safety plan was discussed and agreed upon. Okay. Have you ever received any training to the effect that uh, any form of coercion and obtaining a, an agreement renders the agreement ineffective? No. You've never had that training? No. Did Ms. Wagner give these parents the option of just leaving the kids in their home and 
continuing her investigation. Objection calls for speculation. If you know, was that something you talked to her about on the phone? Can you ask it one more time? Sure. Can I have it reread, please? If you know, was that something you talked to her about on the phone? I think it's the question before that. Did Ms. Wagner give these parents the option of just um, leaving the kids in their home and continuing their investigation? I don't believe that that was ever a discussion Ms. Wagner and I had. Okay. Is, would that have been an option? As if there's no immediate danger to these children, you just leave them in the home and continue your investigation. There was concern, there was immediate concern with the documentation and the information coming from Japan that there had been a pattern of abuse. Do you know whether or not the allegations in Japan had been investigated in Japan? At that exact moment, I don't believe we knew. As time went on, there were provided written, and I believe notarized statements, I'm not 100% on that, from people in Japan that this physical abuse had occurred. Yeah, at some point, did you ever come to learn that those allegations of physical abuse had been made and investigated by a licensed clinical social worker in Japan? No, the information that we had from Luke Air Force Base was that the family had left Japan prior to any kind of services and that it was still ongoing at that time. Did you get some documentation from Luke Air Force Base saying that or is it just somebody on the phone? Initially, it would have been the, the family worker, the family um, advocacy worker. I do believe that there was a There was an, another person involved that I can't recall at this moment because it was a, what we were being told, it was a continual ongoing investigation that they were the ones relaying that they had concerns for these children because of what had happened in, in Japan. Now, what they actually asked you was just to do a welfare check, correct? Not if it's a report, no. Okay. Report means there's allegations. Okay. At some point, did you receive all the documentation from the investigation in Japan? Jack calls for speculation. I don't believe I've ever seen anything from a clinical social worker in Japan. We had the written statements from people making accusations against the family. Okay. And that's, that's all you had, was just the accusations against the I'm family. I'm saying that I've seen, I that I'm see. aware of. If something else came in, I don't recall it today. Okay. Let's see here. Exhibit number 39. Have you had a chance to look through that? Yes, I have. Do you recognize that document? No, I don't. Um, you see down in the bottom right hand corner, there's a Bates number there. It says AZ hyphen CPSF 000037. Yes. You have any understanding what that designation AZ CPS means? No, I don't. Okay. 
I will represent to you that this exhibit number 39 is a document that was produced to the plaintiffs by your attorney in response to a request for production of documents. And I'll ask you, back when you first heard about the Pellerin family, did you yourself talk to anybody at Luke Air Force Base? I believe I was part of one conference call in the very beginning of trying to um, gain some information as to what had happened in Japan. Okay, and who did you speak with? Mr. France or Francis? Mr. Francis, do you recall what agency he was with? He is a civilian employed with the Family Advocacy Center on Luke Air Force Base. Do you recall when that conversation happened? I don't have a specific date, but I would I think it was right around the time frame of when the report came in and we're gathering information at that point. Should that, if I were looking for the notes on that conversation, would it be in the CSRA or in the contact notes? It could be one or either. Um, Well, the contact notes, you don't you usually start inserting data into those unless the CSRA is completed already, correct? Right. But if, if I was to enter a, a contact note as a supervisor or a program manager now, I would go into Childs typically to do that, not through the CSRA. That's now, but what about yeah. back in 2013? Either way. Okay, so it would be in either place. Mm-hmm. That's a yes? Yes, sorry, yes. Yeah, one thing I didn't tell you earlier is that because she's trying to type down everything yes. that we say, you have to answer verbally with words. If I can get you to turn to page number um, using the AZCPSF designation, page number 37 of exhibit number 39, towards the center of the page there, where you see type of maltreatment, child, physical. Do you have any understanding what that means where it says mild? Yes, that somebody who completed this assessment felt that it was mild. Okay, and then the next one says additional information about severity of maltreatment. You see that there, no injury? Correct. Do you have any understanding what that means? That they did not observe any injury. Going back to the beginning of exhibit number 39, um, I already asked you if you recognize it, and you said you didn't, but do you know what this is? Exhibit number 39, what it is? It looks as though it's a report or an assessment that has come from Japan. Okay. And is it your testimony here today that you have never, ever seen this document before? That is correct. Okay. Do you have any understanding as to when it was this assessment would have been done? Per the documentation, it says January 17th of 2013. Okay. Do you recall when it was that the Pellerin family returned to the United States? No, I don't know prior to the April report, but I don't know when. If I can get you to turn to uh, AZCPSF00041. Four one. Yeah, and down at the bottom of the page there, uh, you see where it says risk of further maltreatment right next to the big capital letter A. Yes, I do. Okay, and what's the risk there? It says low. Okay, and the explanation of risk says this, this could be a case where the reporting parties mistakenly identified this family as being the source of the shouting and yelling when in fact the situation actually happened in the neighboring residence. First, did I read that correctly? Yes. Had, did anybody, insofar as you recall, during the time that you were involved with the Pellerin case, ever raise this issue that, uh, that there was some confusion in Japan over who was doing the yelling and screaming at the kids? Objection Foundation assumes facts. Sorry. The question was, did anybody ever raise it as far as you know, during the dependency proceeding here.
I was not present at the dependency hearing, so I don't know if it was raised. Well, not necessarily. I don't want to restrict you to just at the hearings themselves, but there, there was a TDM in this case, right? Yes. Okay, what's a TDM? TDM is a team decision-making meeting where all the parties come together to discuss whatever the concerns are at that time. Okay, did you attend the TDM? I did. Okay, who else to your recollection attended the TDM? Karen was there, the TDM facilitator, Mr. and Mrs. Pellerin, and the grandfather, two grandfathers. How about uh, Ms. Harper, was she there? No. Okay. Was there anybody from the military there? I don't remember. And do you recall anybody from the military being present by telephone? I don't remember. Okay. Do you recall anybody from the military uh, saying words to the effect of they don't know what is going on with this particular case? I remember that there was discussion that there hadn't, ex I don't remember when the, the documents, the statements came in. Prior to that, there was documentation that we, we just didn't know. We had allegations and risk and we were waiting for some kind of, I wish I could remember this gentleman's name, but he was the person that we were talking to who was going back and forth to Japan and he was waiting for documentation. Was that the person from the civilian employee from the Family Advocacy Center? Somehow I don't think so. I, I, I believe this gentleman was an officer involved with OSI or one of their investigation bureaus. Okay, do you know whether or not there was any ever any criminal investigation into these allegations? I don't know about the military. I know Buckeye was involved, Buckeye PD. Was were either of the Pellerins ever charged with a crime? Oh, I didn't know if you were done. Yeah. No, no, no charges that I'm aware of. Okay. Did you ever follow up with Buckeye PD to find out why there were no criminal charges? I did not, but I know Ms. Wagner had a conversation with the detective and there was not enough evidence to move forward. Do you recall a uh, police officer by the name of Matthew Miller? Not off the top of my head. Do you recall ever getting the photographs of the children that were taken the first night at their home? I think it was May 22nd, does that sound right? I think it was. That could be. Um, uh, April 22nd. Was it April? But, let me look, I've got the thing here somewhere. No reason to guess. I wouldn't want you to guess, so I'm not gonna guess either. Uh, where's the date? May is five, right? May is five. May is five. Yeah. So it looks like the uh, protective action safety plan was signed on May 10th, 2013. That would have been the date that the children were placed with the grandparents, correct? Yes, initially, initially mom and the children went to the grandfather's house. Mom and the children? I, I thought so. Who are the but allegations against? Review. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, who were the allegations against? Mom and Dad. Okay. And the allegations in Japan, do you recall who they were against? My recollection, recollection is primarily Mom. Okay. Primarily Mom? Explain that. It was alleged that it was her who had inflicted the injuries on the children. And what specific injuries do you recall? That there was bruising on there was multiple dates that allegedly the children had been observed to have bruises on them. Okay. And it was alleged that it was the mother that inflicted those bruises? Correct. Okay. Out when you were, or when Miss Wagner was out in the field on May 10th looking at the prospects of doing the safety plan, did she ever discuss with you the idea of just having mom move out of the home and leave the children with dad since there were no allegations he abused them. 
check the form, assumes facts. I don't recall a conversation like that. Okay, then going to um, page number AZCPS F000042 of exhibit number 39, towards the bottom of the, of the page there, you see where it says safety plan completed? Yes. And it says yes. I see that. Do you have any understanding of what that means? It sounds as if in Japan they may have had a, some kind of safety plan implemented and it was completed. And then they're right under safety plan completed. Uh, there's another heading there that says explanation. Mm -hmm. Yes. What does that say after it there? It says simple discussion with sponsor. What does that mean to you? That Mr. Pellerin was the military member and that they had had a discussion with him about the concerns. Okay, and do you have any understanding as to whether or not the um, allegations in Misawa were ever determined to be either founded, unfounded, or anything like that, unsubstantiated, un unsubstantiated? Do you know? I don't know. I would assume from reading this that they were unsubstantiated. Okay. Did you ever yourself place a simple phone call to somebody in Japan to find out what happened there? No, we were relying on the family advocacy for that information. Did you ever uh, call any of the witnesses from these so-called witness statements to interview them? No. So it was enough in your mind to just read these witness statements and go out and remove the children? Object form. Join. Subsumes facts, by the way. With what the military was describing to us and the information they had at the time, that was sufficient for us. Didn't have to do uh, any local investigation, didn't have to talk to neighbors, friends, teachers, things like that here in Arizona? I, I'm not sure who Karen did or did not talk to. It is frequent that we might talk to neighbors or we may talk to teachers or professionals at the school. But you're not required to. If it's information to further the investigation, then we are. Do you have any understanding as to whether or not um, parents have a protected and fundamental liberty interest in the continued custody of their children? Probably if you said that in a different way, maybe. Okay. Um, before we get there, we will get there. I want to show you uh, exhibit number 40. And while they're looking at exhibit number 40, do you know who uh, Bill Chittachimo, LCSW, is? Not offhand, no. If you take a look at page number AZ CPSF 000043 of exhibit number 39, mm -hmm. you see that signature there? I do. Um, do you know what LCSW means? Um, licensed Clinical Social Worker. Do you guys use Arizona? By you guys, I mean the state of Arizona use licensed clinical social workers to do their assessments and evaluations and abuse investigations? Do we have investigators with the state of Arizona who are licensed? Possibly, but not all investigators are licensed. And they're not required to be licensed. Correct. And yet they're going out and making assessments of abuse based oftentimes on their view of the psychological condition of the children or parents involved, right? And the training that they've received, correct. <coughs> Everybody have their chance to look at that thing yet? He's looking at it. Okay. <clears throat> Do you have any understanding as to whether or not the military um, found that the allegations did not meet the criteria for physical maltreatment and did not meet the criteria for neglect? 
Do I have any knowledge of that? Yeah. No. Um, once it went to ongoing, what would have been when they would have made that determination towards the end of the case. I didn't know anything with that. So what happens when it gets transferred to ongoing? Do you, the investigations unit, do you just completely back away or how does that work? Yeah, you wrap up your documentation of what you have and you transfer it to an ongoing worker for case management from that point forward. Okay. I'm going to show you what will mark as exhibit number 40 to your deposition. Have you ever seen that letter before? I have seen these letters, maybe not this specific one, but yes. Uh, I have seen these letters. What does that mean? What do you mean by that? I have seen examples of these with other family mem other families, but I have not specifically seen this one. With this family? Correct. Okay. Now, when the military is making its assessment as to whether or not allegations meet or do not meet the criteria for abuse, is that something that they do working hand in hand with your agency, if you know, or do they do it independently? I would say both. But as to this particular um, investigation, you don't know how this document came into existence. Am I getting that right? Well, it's dated January 22nd of 2014, so I'm thinking this happened in 13. By the time they'd gathered more information, maybe that document from Japan, that's what, what helped contributed to this unsubstantiation. Do you know what deferred means there in the first paragraph? Right, that they're waiting for something. And then met would mean that would be the equivalent of Arizona's substantiated, right? I would think so, yes. And then did not meet would be Arizona's equivalent of unsubstantiated, correct? Correct. Do you know whether or not um, the state of Arizona also found the allegations to be unsubstantiated? I don't know that. I can explain the process, but I don't know for this specific case how it resulted. As an investigations unit supervisor, are you at all involved in determining whether or not the allegations are substantiated or unsubstantiated? So if it's a dependency case, the findings go in the record as proposed substantiation based on adjudication, and it would be determined at the court hearing whether or not there would be anything completed. So we could propose to substantiate, but it would be the judge making the decision if there's an adjudication. Okay. So you guys don't actually substantiate or unsubstantiate anything. It's the court that does that. For court hearings, correct or dependency cases. I'm going to show you exhibit number 41, and I guess I need to pass this around to everybody. Also bears uh, Bates numbers AZCPSF00001 through and including 00007. they're looking at that we'll go back and talk about uh, Officer Miller for a moment. You're aware that a police officer was called out to the Pellerin home on or about May 10th to photograph the injuries or lack of injuries to both children, correct? I know there were photographs taken. I'm if that's the date, then yes. Did you ever review any of those photographs? I would think so. I just can't place a the time and place where I was at when I seen them. It may have been in the TDM. Do you know what exactly it was that Officer Miller was documenting? I believe it was the alleged bump to the head and the alleged fingerprints or markings on the child's arms. 
Did you ever speak with Officer Miller after he went out there and documented the injuries or lack of injuries? I did not. Have you read his deposition? Of this officer? Uh huh. No, sir. Do you know whether or not Ms. Wagner ever spoke with Officer Miller about uh, his documentation of injuries or lack of injuries? I can't say she did. I would assume she did, but I, I don't know for a fact if she did. Did you ever learn that, uh, in Officer Miller's opinion, one of the marks was or appeared to be a bug bite and the other didn't appear to be anything substantial? I have heard that, yes. Who'd you hear that from? Miss Wagner. When? Sometime during the investigation phase. Was that before or after the decision was made to remove the children from their parents' home? I wish I had all the dates in front of me. I'm thinking it was before. Okay. All right, so let me just make sure I've got the body of information that was available to you that night. You had the uh, referrals allegedly from the military, correct? The report, yes. Okay. Then you had uh, Miss Wagner's actual face-to-face actual -face view of the children. Yes. And she, I'm correct that as part of that face-to-face -face view, she actually took them into the bathroom and had them uh, partially disrobed so that she could have a view of the skin on their bodies. I don't know about partial disrobing. I mean, you may lift up a sleeve or something or ask a child if they have any marks, but I don't know about okay. something but, more than that. But you do know that she, at a minimum, looked at their skin for bruises, bumps, cuts, those sorts of things. Yes. And then she had a police officer come out and basically do the same thing and take pictures. Okay. Is that correct to your yes. knowledge? Mm -hmm. Foundation. And Ms. Wagner, as far as you understand it or recall, disclosed to you uh, Officer Miller's view of the children, correct? Yes. Okay. And Officer Miller, he didn't take any immediate action at all, did he? He didn't like call in a temporary protective order or anything like that? Not to my knowledge. Okay. He didn't call in for a warrant or anything to take the children? No. Okay. Whose idea was it to enter into a safety plan? Is that yours or Ms. Wagner's? It was discussion with both along with my assistant program manager at that time. The assistant program manager participated in the decision to get this family into a safety plan? Am I understanding you correctly? Yes, because of the information coming from Japan and it was not a typical scenario that we see. We had information coming from the military about something that had happened in another country and we were looking to elevate and get some <clears throat> clarity. And who was that person? What's their name? Sharon Kanick. How do you spell the last name? C-A-N-I-K. And what, what did you say her position was? Well then it was assistant program manager. Was that by phone? That would have been by phone. Okay. Where, where were you physically when all this was taking place? Were you at the office? Right, our office is at the Advocacy Center, which is a different location than the Avondale office. So where were you? At the Advocacy Center. And where was Ms. Kanick? At the Avondale office. Okay, and that's why you guys did like a teleconference or something? Mm -hmm. Yes. How long was that telephone call? Fifteen, twenty minutes. Okay. Let's sort of look at the timing on this. So we have um, Ms. Wagner gets the referral assigned. She goes out to the child's school to uh, school, right? Yes. Do you know roughly about what time of day that was? Not without referring to notes. I don't. Okay. It was before school was out, so before four o'clock, I assume. Okay. 
And we know that the child was not detained or seized at school, correct? Correct. Okay. So at that point in time with the uh, Japan allegations in hand and having interviewed at school, uh, Ms. Wagner didn't feel that it would be appropriate to seize the child there, correct? Correct. Would that be because there was no emergent situation at that point in time? Section 4 calls for speculation. Join. Because she was still gathering information, correct? Okay, and there, there was no concern that the child was going to suffer an immediate injury at the hand of her parents, right? Same objection, speculation. Join. Correct. Okay, and if there had been a concern that the child was going to suffer an immediate injury of some kind at the hands of her parents, then it would have been appropriate for Ms. Wagner right there at school to detain the child. Correct. But instead we know that Ms. Wagner let the child go back to class and then mother came to school later in the day to pick the child up. Is that your understanding? That's my understanding. And then mother took the child home and Ms. Wagner appeared at mother's house later in that afternoon, correct? Correct. What do you know and you may not know that's just going to be dependent on what you've learned through others because I know you weren't personally involved. What do you know of Miss Wagner's um, course of conduct after she left that school? Do you know what she did next? No, I do not. Okay. Do you know what time she arrived? Let me ask you this first. Did she give you a call once she was finished interviewing the child at school? I don't Next recall answer. that. Do you recall whether or not before entering or interviewing the child at school, she obtained consent of either parent? To interview the child at school? No. Do you know whether or not she even attempted to obtain parental consent? No. Okay. In fact, as a matter of policy, the state of Arizona does not um, <clears throat> obtain parental consent prior to interviewing children at school. Ms. State's facts. Am I correct about that? That's correct. Okay. And that's based on your training both as a, you know, from when you were first employed all the way through till now that you're a program manager, correct? Correct. Do you have, do you document in any way the length of the uh, in-school interrogations of children? Like from start to finish, like 303 or whatever, like that right. way? Um, some investigators do, not all of them. Okay. It's not something that's required to be documented? No. Okay. Are you aware of any rules specific to the Ninth Well, let me ask you this first. You understand that Arizona is in the Ninth Circuit, correct? Yes. Okay. And you understand that Ninth Circuit law is binding on the state of Arizona, correct? Yes. Okay, you, you get that in your I training? Do. Okay. Are you aware of uh, any Ninth Circuit cases that restrict in any way your staff's ability to interview children at school without first either obtaining a court order or parental consent? No, I'm not familiar. Okay, you've never had any training about that? About other cases? No. Are you familiar with a case by the name of Green versus Camretta? I've heard of it, but I'm not well enough to have a discussion about it. Okay. What have you heard? What do you remember that you've heard? about Green versus Camretta and the restrictions it imposes on social workers and government agents that seize children? Objective Foundation. Well, let me do this first. You have heard something, right? Because you recognize the name. I recognize the name. Right. Let, what have you heard? That the end result is that we can go into schools and interview children. Under certain circumstances or all circumstances? If we have, I would. If we have an, a report, we can interview a child at school. Well, that's the only criteria. Is that somebody called in a referral? 
to my knowledge. Okay. What about detaining children? Do you remember anything in Green versus Camretta about uh, restricting in any way um, the government agent's ability to detain a child from the custody of its parents? Due to green, due to the green. Yeah. Do you remember anything at all? No. Okay. How about a case by the name of Wallace versus Spencer? You ever heard of that? No. Okay. Uh, Mabe versus County of San Bernardino. No, sir. Ram versus Rubin. No, sir. Rogers versus County of San Joaquin. No. No. So I guess it's a stands to reason then that you haven't had any training on the proscriptions that those cases impose on your workers when they're looking at removing children from the custody of their parents, correct? Object, sure. misstates, yeah. and also assumes facts. Did any of the question we read? No. <laughs> okay, your answer is? I'm not familiar with those cases, so they have not been discussed with me. Okay. I think we talked about this earlier, but uh, I don't recall, I think your answer was that you don't know, but we'll ask it again. Do you know what a warrant is? Well, I know it from a legal stand, or a criminal side, it's mm -hmm. when a police officer has to go and obtain something from a judge in order to go into the home or seize property or interview or do certain things, what's ever written on the warrant. Okay, so they can seize a person, they can seize property, whatever's in the warrant. My understanding. And it's your understanding that the, the police they actually have to go to a judge to essentially get permission to do that? Yes. Do you have any understanding as to what, well, let me ask you this way. Is it your understanding that, that your subordinates are not held to the same standards as a police officer? Object form. Join. That is my understanding. And that's based on your training with the state of Arizona? Based on the policies that are given to us, yes. Okay. So just make sure I'm clear here. As a program manager, now, mm -hmm. today, 2016, it is your understanding that there is no requirement that your subordinates do the same sorts of things that police would do. For example, get a warrant to seize a child from its parents, as sure. an example. Am I correct about that? Objection. It, I assume facts. Join. Is my understanding that they do not. Okay. Is there any set of circumstances that you can think of, any set of circumstances at all, where one of your workers would be required to get a warrant before seizing a child from its parents? I am not familiar with that, no. Do you know whether or not there is any kind of procedure in place with, uh, what do you guys call yourself now? Is it AIDS? Department of Child Safety. Department of Child Safety. Is that a recent change? About a year and a half ago, I think. Okay. I gotta keep up with these things. Right. Okay, Department of Child Safety. Is there any procedure in place with the Department of Child Safety whereby one of your workers can obtain a court order to seize a child. Such as a pickup order. But a pickup order, correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm having a little bit of confusion here. A pickup order is a little bit different, isn't it? Because a pickup order is sort of um, only really fits certain circumstances, like if the child's gone AWOL or run away or that sort of thing, right? Yes, I can, maybe an example would help, but if we had, like I said, parents that had absconded with a child, we mm -hmm. could file a pickup order for those children. Mm -hmm. But what about, what, what, I, what I sort of want to, I'm wondering, is where we have a situation like here, where there's a family in a home, they're not running away, they're not absconding, the children haven't gone AWOL or run off, everybody's, they're in the home, but there's not necessarily an immediate danger to the child, but you think there might be a danger at some point in the future. Is there some process or procedure in place with the Department of Child Safety whereby the worker can go into court and explain to a judge, hey look, 
I've got this family, there might be a problem, I'd like to remove the children and get an order. Is there some process or procedure like no. that? No. Typical compound, some facts. Join. Go ahead. No. Okay. Has there ever been a process or procedure like that? Same objection, compound, and some facts. Join. Not to my knowledge. Okay. So correct me if I'm wrong here. I want to make sure my understanding of what I've learned with you here today is correct. That we really have two options. One is we go out, we investigate, and we either put the child in or put the family into a safety plan. Or, actually I guess there's three options. Let me strike that and start over completely. We have three options. One is we investigate, find nothing wrong, and leave. Would that be correct? That's an option. Okay. The other option would be we investigate, we have some concerns, we get the family into a safety plan. That is an option. The third option is we investigate, their concerns, they won't do a safety plan, we take the child. I think there's a fourth in there and that would be going out and a family's willing to participate in services to address what the concerns are in the home. How is that different from a safety plan? Safety plan is you're bringing somebody in to provide some type of supervision whereas a non-case with no safety plan would be, say it's a risk situation, a dirty house, and they need help cleaning the house, mm -hmm. something like that, where you're putting in in-home okay. in services. Okay. So for example, uh, I guess what, what do you call that? Do you call that like voluntary services or yes. voluntary services plan? Yes. Okay. So we actually have four options. One is the investigate, nothing's wrong, we leave. Two is investigate, there's a concern, we do a safety plan. Three is we investigate, there's a concern, we take the child. And four would be we investigate, there may be a concern, and we do some voluntary services. Does that pretty much sum it up? That sounds right. Okay, are there any other options? Well, there are other, there, there's a couple others that don't necessarily pertain to this. There's, we have something called a 90-day voluntary. Mm -hmm. um, there's some other avenues we can go down. But I think basically the four types of cases we come across are that. Okay. All right. And just to clarify, when you're looking at the second option, that is the safety plan option, Am I correct that uh, part of the process of getting the parent is into the safety plan as a matter of practice is to explain to the parent that they can either do the safety plan or the child goes to foster care? Am I right on that? As I stated earlier, I would hope it's not coming out as either or, it's a discussion of what we need to do and we're you know, wanting to ensure the safety of the children during the investigation, so it's a, a cooperative plan. Well, see that's where I'm having a little bit of trouble. Because you have this discussion with the parent, right? Right. And it's an open, honest discussion, right? Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes, yeah, sorry. And sometimes the parents don't agree, right? Correct. So how do we get them to agree when they don't agree, how do we get there? Well, if you're saying that you need to complete your investigation and during the time frame of the investigation, if we can get the aunt or grandpa or someone to come into the home or whatever the circumstance is, it keeps the children safe in that circumstance, in that situation, in the home or however you work that out. Well, you, you would agree with me though, wouldn't you ma'am, that in some of these investigations, the, the parents don't even see a problem there, right? Correct. And in some of those situations, the parents just don't agree to a safety plan where their kids are gonna be taken out of their home, right? Correct. So how do we get them to agree? 
I don't have an answer of how we get them to agree. I mean, it's a okay. conversation. Okay, and as part of that conversation, if you have a parent who doesn't agree, since it is an open and honest conversation, y you let them know that the other option is to take the child and put them in foster care, right? Check the form, incomplete, hypothetical. Join. I can only speak for myself as an investigator or supervisor or what have you. If, I, if I'm talking to you and telling you, these are my safety concerns in your home, and you know, I might have enough right now to remove, but I don't want to do that. I'm trying to do this least restrictive. I still consider it a conversation. Okay. Do you get any training about uh, how the parents might perceive that conversation? I can't say we get training on it. I think you learn as you go and the more experience you have, you run into many circumstances, many situations. But we do know that as part of that conversation at some point, your workers are trained to let the parents know that if we can't get this child into a safety plan, the child's gonna to go to foster care. There right? are some situations that that is accurate. Do you know whether or not that happened here with the Pellerin case? I do not. I was not present at that initial conversation. I don't know. Did Miss Wagner, or let me ask you this, uh, did anybody ever um, raise with you any concern about um, the way Miss Wagner approached this family on the evening of May 10th? In the TDM, it was brought up that the family was not happy with her, yes. What did they say? Why weren't they happy? My words won't be exact, but I think they felt that she was aggressive. Dishonest? I don't think I heard that word. By the time of the TDM, had any uh, reports of any kind been filed? On? With the court. I, again, I don't have the dates all laid out. There's a long time mm -hmm. ago. I don't believe at the time of the TDM, the petition had been filed. Did the TDM happen before or after the children had been removed from the grandparents' home, if you recall? I don't recall, but I'm assuming it was after because that would be what the TDM would be for. Okay, and after the children were removed from the grandparents' home, that's when a petition worksheet was put together? Yes. How many days after the removal, uh, pursuant to Arizona's policies, how many days do you have after the removal to get your petition filed? It has to be filed within 72 hours, but it means it has to be submitted to the AG within 66 hours so that they have time to type it up and file it. Is there any time requirement relative to when you have to have the TDM? There's no time requirement. Um, it's as soon as you possibly can, because okay. that time comes fast. And the only complaint you remember uh, coming out at the TDM was that Ms. Wagner was aggressive? I think there was other ways that it was put. They were not happy with her decision. Which decision? To implement the safety plan that she wasn't just closing the case and that she wasn't believing that nothing had happened in Japan. Well, we didn't do the TDM until after the children had been removed from the grandparents, right? I believe so. Did anybody ever complain about uh, Miss Wagner's aggressive behavior in removing the children from the grandparents? I think it was all in one. I don't think it was anything it was at the TDM when I heard the concerns. Now, this voluntary safety plan, that's the one that was entered into on May 10th, is that correct? If you recall. I, it, 
Let me show it to these guys no, first. Yeah. Exhibit number 10. recognize that document? I do. And what is that document? That is a safety plan. Okay, now the safety plan, Form. that's, I'm sorry, go Form. ahead. Form. <laughs> now the safety plan, that's something that, at least according to you, is voluntary with the parents? That is correct. And they can also revoke it, correct? That is correct. So they're not really actually giving up legal custody of their child, correct? That's correct. And at some point, if they revoke it, it's no longer effective, correct? That's correct. When you go in to a home that's under a safety plan, is it, according to your training, are you required to assess the safety of the child before you remove from that home? You understand my question? You're asking if we've assessed the safety of the children prior to doing this. No, let's try again. Okay, we have a, let's just use this situation here. Right. We, we have a, a family where your investigator's gone out and right or wrong has made an assessment, put this family into a safety plan, right? Okay. Now the kids are off, that, that's correct so far, correct? Yes. Okay, now the kids are off with grandparents, right? Yes. Before those children can be removed from the grandparents, is there any new safety assessment that has to be done? That can work either way, yes. Um, either something has happened to violate the safety plan or it, something has happened to not need it any longer. And when you say violate the safety plan, and make sure I'm understanding you correctly, is it your testimony that if the safety plan is violated, automatically you can take the children without getting a court order? If a safety plan is violated, you're looking at how and what has been the impact on the kids. To, to file the dependency, you would still need to move forward with the same information. So have I seen... That's two parts of your question. It's hard to answer. There's yes and no. Okay, let, let's, let's try this. Let's just keep it specific to this situation here. You, you would agree with me, wouldn't you, that in order to remove a child from the custody of its parents, there has to be evidence that the child is likely to suffer immediate, severe physical bodily injury in a short period of time, right? That's correct. Okay. And that holds true whether we're with the parents or under a safety plan with the grandparents. Correct. Okay. So there is, there is no legal authority to just automatically seize a child, even under a safety plan, unless that child is in immediate danger of suffering severe bodily injury. Correct? Yes, after gathering all the information of, of what's going on. Yes, you have to be able to say or feel that the child's at, at risk of imminent neglect. Right, and if, have you ever been trained that the intrusion into that custodial interest by, by the parent, the parent's custodial interest, has to be narrowly tailored to address the specific danger? You ever learned that? Yes. Okay, what was the specific danger you guys were trying to avert um, on the evening of May 21st, 2013? What was the specific injury you were trying to avert? 
we were being told through the military that these children had suffered abuse and neglect on multiple dates prior to them being in Arizona. Taking that information and taking the interviews with the children, there was concern. Well, wait a minute. You went out on May 10th, put the children into a safety plan. The evening of May 10th, they were, well, you didn't, but Ms. Wagner did, and you approved it, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Took the children on May 10th, put them with the grandparents that night, right? Yes. Okay. Then later, on May 21st, 2013, Ms. Wagner, again with your approval, went out and took the children from the grandparents, correct? after the safety plan had been violated and we could not ensure their safety with the grandparents. Yes. What was the specific injury that you were attempting to avert by removing the children from the grandparents on May 21st, 2013? What was the specific injury? Again, it was the pattern of the information being provided that they had been previous injuries and the child was, the female child was disclosing about what was going on in the home, that mom was spanking, she was using a spoon, it was, she was caring for her sibling, having to wipe feces out of his mouth, etc. It was determined the children were not safe at that point. Well, by the time that we got to May 21st, there had already been a forensic interview, right? Both well, children? I believe so, if you're saying so. I don't have the dates right in front of me. I don't know what date the okay. forensic was. Let, let's do this this way. At some point, you learned that there had been a forensic interview of both children, right? Okay, yes. Okay. Did you read the transcripts of those interviews? I didn't read the transcripts. I had was part of the staffing with the forensic interviewer and Karen at the advocacy center. So you were there? No, it was been after they were completed. And then somebody just came and reported to you? They, they briefed the case out, yeah, that's with the detective from Buckeye PD. What does that mean, they briefed the case out? You get all the DCS, police, the forensic interviewer, and talk about what you've heard and what was going on. Okay, and did anybody in that briefing explain to you that uh, denied all this stuff, that she got beat with a spoon, that she wiped feces out of her brother's mouth, denied all that? Anybody ever explain that to you? Object form some facts. It was also a concern that she had been told not to talk and not to say anything any further at that point. Okay, move to strike is non-responsive. Can I get my question reread and we'll get an answer to that question? And did anybody in that briefing explain to you that denied all this stuff, that she got beat with a spoon, that she wiped Lucy's out of her brother's mouth, denied all of that? Anybody ever explain that to you? Yes. Okay. Who? <clears throat> the forensic interviewer, I believe her name was Abby. Abby, do you know her last name? I couldn't tell you right now. Okay. Now you know that that uh, interview was recorded, right? I believe they recorded, yes. Did you ever listen to the tape? No, sir. Do you know if it was video recorded? They usually are video recorded, yes. And you never watched the video? No. Okay. You didn't think that was important? I felt the information I was getting from the forensic interviewer and my caseworker and the detective were sufficient. And you don't recall whether that was before or after the decision was made to remove the children from the grandparents on May 21st? Well, I think you said that the, the forensics were before the TDM, so it would have been before. I don't know if they were before the TDM or not. I'm just asking you. I don't, re I don't have the dates in front of me. Okay. I'm going to show you what will mark as exhibit number 6. And actually, before we get on to exhibit number 16, you guys all finish your review of number 41, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Show you uh, what we'll mark as exhibit number 41 to your deposition. You recognize that? Yes, it is a copy of a report. Uh, what kind of report? This is what is, when something is called into the hotline, this is what the reports print out as. This is what we receive in the offices. Okay.
So if you turn to um, the second page mm -hmm. of Exhibit 41, the one Bates marked AZCPSF 000002. Yes. What is that part of the report? Is that the same part? Is that the same report or is that some add on? What is this? When you call into the hotline, they ask you some questions, and this is the summary of what's typed up and presented to us. Okay. If you look down, uh, you see on, there's a line down there that says on January 15th, 2013. You see that line? Yes. The next paragraph below that, it says it was reported that the parents stopped hitting. First, did I read that right? Yes. Okay. When was it that they stopped hitting you? No, or if you can tell. I do not know. Okay. But we do know that as of the time of this report, it was reported that they were no longer hitting, right? According to this, yes. And uh, was that back in Japan, if you know? It's not clear as to when it is. Okay. Were there, was there any information in the military reports that uh, you received to indicate that uh, the little boy was being abused in any way? No, my understanding the concern was that he was being parented by his older sister. Uh, where, where is that in this report? It's not in this report. That's what came out from Karen Wagner after talking with the children and gathering up other information. And so it was Miss Wagner that came up with that information. I believe that's what. Foundation. Go ahead. I believe that's what told her. Were you there when she interviewed? No, sir. Was the uh, interview tape recorded, if you know? No. No, you don't know or no, it wasn't? It was not tape recorded. Okay, so we just have to take Ms. Wagner's word for it. Yes. Okay. And that's one of the reasons, isn't it, that you go ahead and do a forensic interview once a child's been taken, is you want to verify what's actually been said, right? Correct. Okay. And that was one of the reasons that you, you guys did a forensic interview of here, right? Buckeye form assumes facts. Go ahead. Buckeye PD requested the forensic interview. Buckeye PD did. That's interesting. Let me see if I can find what I'm looking for. And maybe you can help me understand what it is. Let me ask you this first. Is there a difference between the forensic interview and the forensic medical exam? Or is that all part and parcel of the same thing? It's partially the same thing, but it's two totally different things. Well, I understand it's two separate events, right? Right. But do we, do we make a written request for them together as one whole package, or does that come separately? How does that work? If a decision is made to do a medical exam, DCS um, covers the cost of it, so there's a signature that comes with that. Okay. Who actually makes the request? Typically, it's the forensic interviewer and or the um, assigned detective to the case. Okay. Is it ever the uh, investigator? It can be. Okay. And they have to fill out a form or something, sign it? Correct. Does a supervisor have to sign off on that form? I don't think they have to, but sometimes they do. Okay. Uh, show exhibit number 25.
Take a moment, just look at that. Okay. Let me see one more thing real quick. Let me see something. You see the signatures down at the bottom of the page there? I do. Do you recognize those signatures? I do. Whose signatures are they? Karen Wagner and myself. Okay. Do you recall signing this request for a uh, forensic medical exam? I don't recall it, but that's my signature. And who is Lori? I can't tell what that says at the top there. Can you read that? No, I don't know if that's who's going to be working on the financial piece of it or if that was the medical, I, I don't know. Now there's a bubble that's filled in here under physical abuse towards the bottom of the page. You see that? Yes. And this was as to both children? Yes. Wasn't it, uh, there weren't any allegations of physical abuse towards, were there? Not in the... Object to form. Go ahead. Not in the current, but had stated that she had seen bruises on her brother's back. Stated that? When did state that? I believe in the interview that Karen had with them. So again, we're relying just on Miss Wagner for that information? Yes. Okay. Now, Miss Wagner didn't make any notes of her interview in the computer system immediately after the interview, right? She did that later. I believe so. She probably had, talking for her, she probably had handwritten notes. That's typically what they do and they compile it all at the end. And what happens to those handwritten notes once it's compiled and entered into the computer system? They're usually discarded. Okay, or destroyed. Right. So we don't actually know what appeared in those handwritten notes. No. Okay. But we do know from the referral that came in to your agency that there were no allegations of physical abuse or injuries towards, correct? That is what the summary on there says. That is not entirely everything we heard from the military. We heard both children. We weren't clear on if it was just one. Have you ever heard of a case called Calabretta v. Floyd? No, sir. Have you ever heard that in order to do a forensic um, examination on a child, you need a court order or an exigency? No, sir. Here in the state of Arizona, you guys just do them as a matter of course? Jack, the state's testimony assumes facts. Join. If it's part of a criminal investigation and a detective is, you're working along with a police agency and they're requesting it, yes, we do that. Oh, so if it's part of a criminal investigation, then you go ahead and do one of these forensic medical examinations. Did I get that right? On some cases, not what? 100%. All. Well, on this case you did. On this case we did. Okay. And you didn't have a court order permitting it, right? No. What was the emergency on uh, May 28th that warranted going ahead and doing this forensic medical exam without first getting court approval, if any? I believe after the forensic interview that it was just discussed between the detective and the forensic interviewer that they wanted to have a medical done and so we agreed with it. Let me try this again, maybe you didn't understand the question. What was the emergency on May 28th, 2013, that made you feel that you didn't need to get a court order to do this forensic medical exam? Well, let me explain. A medical forensic exam is not only in the time of like an abrasion or, you know, a broken bone. It can determine if something is a mosquito bite or a bruise or deep or, you know, time frames. You get a lot of other information. So, there may not have been an emergency at that moment, but it's descriptive in nature of what's going on. Well, see, I'm confused again. Let me see if we can work our way through this. When you take a child into custody, and they may be going to foster care, at some point in time, fairly soon after the removal, 
you want to get them evaluated medically to make sure that they're not sick, that they don't have some condition or disease or illness or something that needs to be treated before you put them in foster care, right? Correct. That's not the same as a forensic medical exam, is it? No. Okay. Forensic medical exam is something that you do to develop evidence, right? Well, that may be of what the criminal side of it's about or the police side, we're trying to determine if the injuries are factual, or if they're truly bruises, is it a Mongolian spot, is there some other explanation? Okay. Do you have, and by you I mean the department in your capacity now as a program manager, do you know whether or not the department has any procedure by which your workers would obtain a court order permitting a forensic medical examination? No. Do you have any understanding as to whether or not under Ninth Circuit law you, your agency would be required to get a warrant to permit or court order to permit a forensic medical examination absent some emergent circumstance. I'm not familiar with that. You've never had any training on that? No. Now, I notice here again on this exhibit number 25, there's five different little bubble points we can mark. One is sexual abuse, the other is physical abuse high-risk drug child, CAT scan brain, MRI brain, you see those? Yes. And on this particular one, that's exhibit number 25, the sexual abuse bubble is not marked, am I correct? Correct. Was there ever a, a sexual abuse exam requested? Not to my knowledge. Was there ever any allegation that either of the children had been sexually abused in any way? No. So why was it that uh, the little boy was directed to um, take up the supine position and have his anus examined? Egyptian Foundation. I can't answer that. I don't know. But you know that did happen. I can't say that I did know that happened. Did you read the reports? Yes, but it has been quite a while ago. I mean, as part of the process of approving your subordinate workers' reports to the court and investigatory conduct, you, you have to review the reports, right? We don't always have, well, we review the information that they provide us. I don't know when we received the copies of the medical report. I don't know if they came in prior to that. I, I don't know that. Did, did you have any conversation with Ms. Wagner wherein uh, you directed her to have this child's anus inspected? No. But why do you suppose that would happen in a situation where there are no allegations at all of sexual abuse? Foundation. I can only speculate that they were looking for examples of or any kind of physical abuse, but I, I don't know. Did anybody ever complain to you, um, other than in this litigation that we're in right now, mm -hmm. did anybody ever complain to you about the um, examination of either of the children's sex organs? I don't recall that, no. Do you have any understanding why there would even be an examination of these children's sex organs? I do not know that. I, I don't know why there would be. You never directed it? No, I didn't. Okay, okay going back for a moment to exhibit number 41. If you can turn to, I'll tell you where it is here. Internal page six of seven, it's Bates number AZCPSF 000006. Um, you see that there? Correct, yes. What, what is that that we're looking at? Is that still part of the same form? Yes, it's the different allegations that come in. There's, there's many different kinds of allegations that can be made against a multitude of people, so 
what you're looking at on the first one is that it's a, the victim, the perpetrator's blocked out, and that it's a P2 neglect. Then the same thing below for, and then there was also a P3 for again. So there's two different allegations against one of the parents on that. And then over Unless to there's the more. over to the next page. There's so yeah, one more there, right? Right. So there's two and two. There's two allegations against both parents against both kids. And then two of those are level two priority risks. The other two are level three priority risks. Correct. And all of those are unsubstantiated. That is correct. Okay, if we go back to and again, what does unsubstantiated mean? In this case, with a dependency hearing, that means the court did not find an adjudication. Meaning that the court actually found against the agency. Object four. Jam. Correct? That's a legal question. I don't know. There wasn't enough to substantiate. Go do find you, the dependency, I'm sorry. Do you know whether or not the terms substantiated and unsubstantiated are defined by statute in the state of Arizona? Yes. Okay, what's the definition that you learn in your training for the term unsubstantiated? So if we were doing our own finding without a dependency trial and we were entering our own findings that there's not enough information to support the finding of whatever that specific allegation is. That there's not enough. Are there any other terms that you use besides substantiated and unsubstantiated? No. You don't have inconclusive out here? No. Okay, so the allegation is either substantiated or unsubstantiated, right. period. Right. Okay. Going back to um, page three of seven, that'd be AZCPSF00003. You see there, all the allegations there are uh, level four priority risk, correct? Correct. And if you go over to the next page, page four of seven, that's, uh, those are all priority level four as well? Correct. Okay. Is there any way we can tell when it was that these allegations were, well, let me ask it this way. If you look on, on page three under allegations, in the first paragraph, top of the page, and then you go down. There's a date there. It says date modified, 4-22-2013. Right. What does that mean? I believe that's at the hotline of when it's coming into the hotline, and there can be different dates depending on what information's coming in. So that's when the I believe that that means that that's when the hotline received it. Okay, I gotcha. And then if we look over here in the middle of the page, it says response date. May 10th, 2013, is that when Ms. Wagner would have first got assigned and gone out to investigate? It's when she would have gone out to investigate. Assignment date would be somewhere else, but that's when she enters in the computer when she's responded to the report. Okay, I got it. So it was about 18, is that right, 18 days between the time that the referral came in and the time that Ms. Wagner finally got out there to investigate? On the page one, it's saying that it was assigned to her on April 30th. April 30th. Okay, so between, I'll go back to my question. Um, it was 18 days between the time that the referral came in to your agency and Ms. Wagner finally got out to investigate it, correct? By looking at the dates, that's correct. And then the response time here over to the right where it says 2.20 p.m., what's that? That's the time she entered in the system of when she saw the first victim child. Okay, and that would have been uh, the little girl? Yes. At school? Yes. Okay. Then the next one um, down where it's talking about, again, that's a priority level four for physical abuse, correct? Yes. And is there any way we can tell when she started the investigation on that one? This is all one report. Okay. Multiple allegations, so that all suffices for the one. Okay, and 
where it says proposed, and then there's an acronym here, S-U-B-S-T-D, pending DEP adjudication, I guess. Yeah, proposed substantiation pending the dependency adjudication. Okay. That's what I was saying. That's what we put into the system until adjudication is either found or not found. Okay. So on all of these, once you've got a uh, initial investigation done, they're all, at least on this, this exhibit number 41, they're all proposed substantiated, correct? Correct. Okay. And this code over here where it says allegation characteristic 204, what does that mean? We have all of our allegations listed out um, by sex abuse, uh, physical abuse, you know, so on and so forth. And so 204 has an actual finding, an actual allegation with it. I don't okay. know them by hand. Okay, all of these, though, look like they're all physical abuse allegations, correct? Yes, I believe so. I don't see any for neglect. Are there any for neglect here? On the page six. Six. Those categories were under the neglect categories. Okay, and it looks like... Uh, What does that mean? If you look at the top of page six, over on the left-hand side, right under where it says substantiated, it says investigation date June 25th, 2013. Do you see that? I do. What does that mean? I'm believing that's the date that the investigation was completely, well, that doesn't make sense because that's a closure date. Um, I'm not clear. I don't know. Well, we see the investigation closure date was August 23rd, 2013, correct? Or am I reading Correct, that right. Okay. No, you're correct. So would the investigation closure date typically come after the investigation date? Yes, because that's when you you have everything wrapped up and your CSRA is completed. Okay. And the investigation closure date here was August 23rd, 2013. What is the CIU received date? What is CIU? Let me check. Can I just look sure. for one second? I want to... Sure. So... It's two different reports. If you look on the first page, that's one report number, and back here it's a second report number. So that was two different reports that came in. So the first report was 721874, and then there was a report that came in 731982. Where are you seeing seven? Th oh, I see it. I see it. Okay. Who made that report? Anyway, we can tell the, the one that's depicted on page six here. Who made that report? By looking at this, I don't know. Can we tell when it was that the report was made? Well, I'm thinking that's what the 625.13 date is. Okay. I'm thinking that maybe it came into the hotline on the 21st and it was assigned or something on the 25th. And there's no way we can tell who made that report? I can't from... tell by looking at this, but it, there is a way to, to find out. How would we go about finding out? Um, printing out the report from the system, looking in the system. What do we call that thing? Childs. No, I mean the oh. report itself, the one that would tell us who, who called in this additional allegation. Um, the reporting source on that specific report. Okay. I noticed this is after the date that uh, it was decided to not follow the court's order to return the child per, or children, correct? Miss fact. 
Yes. Okay. Do you have any understanding as to whether or not uh, somebody at the agency itself actually generated this report? I don't know. Is that something that can happen? Is that somebody within the agency generates a report? Anyone can call into the hotline and make a report. So, for example, Ms. Harper could have done it. Yes. Ms. Wagner could have done it. Yes. You could have done it. Yes. Okay. You don't remember doing it, do you? I didn't do it. Okay. Let's take a little break. I the time is 2.12 p.m. off the record. Time is 2.32 p.m. back on the record. Okay, I'm going to show you what we marked as exhibit number 16. And if you can just tell me what that is. This is a notice of removal. Okay, did you approve this notice of removal? Yes. How can you tell? Well, I'm looking at the date of May 21st, and um, my name's on it, although I'm, I didn't sign it. Do you recall having a telephone conversation or some other kind of communication with Ms. Wagner on May 21st, 2013? relative to this uh, removal of the children? <clears throat> I don't, and I'm getting dates mixed up. I, I'm not sure what this is. Well, let me try and help you. You recall okay. that uh, the initial investigation was on May 10th, 2013, right? Okay. And Ms. Wagner, with your approval, um, under the terms of a safety plan, remove the children from their parents and place them with the grandparents on the evening of May 10th, 2013, correct? Okay. Objection, Ms. States. Is that correct as to your recollection? It sounds about right. Okay. Then sometime later, um, again with your approval, Ms. Wagner removed the children from the grandparents' home, correct? Correct. And do you recall whether or not that was May 21st, 2013? It sounds about right. Okay. If that's what the date is, then that coincides with that. Does this document that's depicted as exhibit number 16, um, is this what we also refer to as a TCN? No, this is a notice of removal that is typically served, given to somebody. The TCN copies go to the parents. Notice of removal if I'm removing somebody from somebody else. Okay, so the notice of removal would have gone to the grandparents. Correct. And then at some point in time, a, is that the TCN's temporary custody notice? Correct. At some point in time, the temporary custody notice would have been provided to the parents. Correct. How long? Well, is there a period of time relative to the actual seizure of the children when that temporary custody notice is supposed to be provided to the parent? As soon as possible. I don't think there's an exact time frame attached to it, but you're, you're doing it all together. You're letting them know that this is what we're doing either by phone and then getting them the hard copy later, but it's, it's all together. Okay, do you know if these parents, the Pellerins, were provided with a temporary custody notice within 24 hours of the time that their children were removed from the grandparents' home? I do not know for fact if they were or were not. I would assume so, but I don't know. Okay. Did you ever talk to Ms. Wagner about that? About providing the parents with their temporary custody notice? If there was some reason that she did it telephonically, I would have been saying that they need to get the hard copies over there, okay. but I don't remember that conversation. Okay. Show you what's uh, marked as exhibit number 17 to your deposition. 
Do you recognize that? That is a TCN, temporary custody notice. Okay, and this is the notice that would have been provided to the parents then, correct? Correct. Okay. And uh, I see here where it says on exhibit 17 on page number AZCPSF 000020, top of the page, describe the specific reasons temporary custody is necessary. Do you see that? I do. Um, am I correct in understanding, and maybe I'm not, you'll correct me. Am I correct? in understanding that what we're required to do here, where it's saying sp provide the specific reasons, you're supposed to let us know in detail why it is that you're removing the child, right? Correct. Do they do that here? Does Ms. Wagner tell us in detail why it is she's removing the child? It's very vague. It just says neglect, right? Correct. Neglect by who? Not clear. Going back to that concept we were talking about earlier about how uh, we can only remove a child from the custody of its parents to avert a specific injury. Can you tell from looking at this temporary custody notice what specific injury it was Ms. Wagner was trying to avert? I can look at the check boxes and see where she put other circumstances. Okay, let's do that. What were the other circumstances? the history of what Japan was reporting. Where does it say that? It doesn't. So as a parent or, or a court or anybody else in looking at this temporary custody notice, where am I to go to figure out why it is that uh, these children are being removed? It's not written correctly. Was Ms. Wagner disciplined in any way for not following the uh, procedures and providing this temporary custody notice? She was not. Why not? I think that the, the combination of having the upper management involved, that this was not a, a normal situation for her, this is not typical of her, her documentation. I'm not clear that she knew what to put on here. Well, upper management didn't actually get involved until after the court dismissed the case, correct? Right. And that so would have been in is, June. You're right. My mistake. I'm sorry. In, that one. in June 2013. Not, I got my dates mixed up. You're right. This is the beginning. Okay. So May 21st, 2013. Uh, why wasn't Ms. Wagner disciplined in some way for failing to at least fill out this notice the way that it should have been filled out? Check form foundation. No explanation. Did you review this form at some point in time? Uh, fairly close in time to when the children were seized from the grandparents' home? No, I wouldn't have seen it until, you, until later. Do you recall talking to Ms. Wagner about whether or not she should seize these children from the grandparents? Checked form. Argumented. We did have a conversation regarding the violation of the safety plan, yes. And what specifically was the violation of the safety plan? My understanding is there was two parts to it. Um, the grandparents were testing the children or one of the children regarding the discipline techniques. Um, they were seeing if the detectives were correct in, or not correct or if DCS was correct or not correct in how many push-ups or whatever the discipline was. And the children had been allowed to go to a shooting range of some sort over the weekend prior without the safety monitors present. Okay, who was it that alleged this shooting range thing even happened? I'm not sure how that information came to Ms. Wagner's attention. Okay, at some point in time, though, it actually came to your attention that the event did not happen as described by Ms. Wagner, correct? Jack misstates evidence. No, I don't recall that. You don't recall getting an email or a letter from somebody? You were CC'd on it? You don't remember that? No. Okay. 
you didn't remember ever being CC'd on any communications from either of the grandparents. Maybe so. Again, a long time ago, I haven't, I wouldn't have those any longer, but I'm, maybe. Do you know who Ashton Pellerin is? I think he's an adult brother to either Mr. or Mrs. Pellerin. Do you recall Ashton Pellerin uh, or somebody relating to you that Ashton Pellerin was not even around in town at the time Miss Wagner claimed this shooting thing happened? No, I don't remember that. You don't remember ever learning that? Not right this minute. A difference to you at that point in time back in May 2013 if you learn that in fact the person who purportedly took these kids out shooting wasn't even in town. Object to Miss State's testimony and fact. That could have impacted the decision absolutely. How? Well if they didn't violate the safety plan then they didn't violate the safety plan. Did anybody, right I, I agree, at any point in time, did anybody ever uh, express to you that the little boy didn't even know what a push-up was? I do remember conversation back and forth in the TDM about whether he knew or didn't know. Did you ever follow up to have one of these investigators interview, find out whether or not he knew what a push-up was? Again, I don't have my, I wish I had a timeline. Um, there was a conversation, but I just don't know who asked or who would have asked. I don't know if it was addressed in the for forensic interviews or if it came in a later time. Well, you brought with you today a document that you reviewed in preparation for your deposition, correct? Right. Are there any other documents besides this one that you reviewed in preparation for your deposition? A few minutes back, um, I pulled up the case to try to get some of the dates in my head because 2013 is quite a while ago, but no documents, no. I don't have the hard file. We'll have to mark this as, uh, let's mark it as Exhibit A to the deposition. A? A. And, uh, let her put a stamp no, on it first and then we'll talk about it. Okay, what is that document that we've marked as Exhibit A? This is a CSRA. This is the document that is completed upon investigation completion. Okay. And that is the document that until it's completed, all of our contact notes and everything should go in there? Correct. Or rather, all of our con notes of all of our contacts should go in there? Correct. Okay, so if you need to at any point in time during this deposition to refresh your recollection, would it help to look at the CSRA? It probably would. Okay, <laughs> when's the last time you reviewed the CSRA? Um, last week. Okay, let's, let's do this. Um, at any point, for any of my questions, if it would help you to look at it, then just let me know that. You can stop and take, take okay. time, take a look at it, refresh your recollections. I don't want you guessing about things. If you really don't know, then you don't know. Um, but if you're able to, you know, refresh your recollection, I'd like to do that. Okay. So, with that being said... I don't actually recall what my last question was before we got on to that. If it was important, I'd remember it. <laughs> so I'm going to show you what we'll mark next as Exhibit 22. Uh, for everybody, that's just the dependency worksheet. I presume you've already got it. Yeah. You want to look at this? No, I saw that. Okay. Thank you. Okay, show you Exhibit number 22. If you can take a look at that and let me know what that is. You named it correctly. It's the worksheet when the petition's being filed. Okay, so earlier in the day when you were talking about how uh, once the child has been seized, 
somebody will put together a dependency worksheet and send that over to the Attorney General's office, this Exhibit 22 is what you were talking about? Correct. Okay. Does the supervisor, is the supervisor required to review and approve the dependency worksheet before it goes to the AG's office? No. Okay, that's something that the worker uh, can just do on their own? Correct. Okay. At any point in time before a petition is filed, uh, as the supervisor, and this is for you back in 2013 when this particular petition was being filed. As a supervisor, did you have any obligation before the petition was filed to review Ms. Wagner's work to make sure that it comported with policy? To review and staff with her throughout, yes. Um, to review this document before she submits it, no. What do you do if any, let, let, let me ask it this way first, generally. A supervisor's responsibilities in supervising their investigator, and let's just focus for the moment on a situation where we have a child that's been seized from its home. What are the supervisor's responsibilities in that situation? So initially at the time of removal, you're, you're staffing it, you're asking what information they have, um, you're staffing with your next up to give them a heads up on what the case is and what's going on. Um, you might be participating, may or may not participate with the phone call with the AG. Um, and then monitoring that everything gets completed timely, that the CSRA is completed, it's submitted to the ongoing, that the court report gets filed. So really just uh, your responsibility as a supervisor is just to make sure essentially that timelines and deadlines are met? Pretty much. Do you have any obligation to review the content of the various um, documents, reports, things like that to ensure their accuracy and completeness? Yes. And how do you do that? How do you go about ensuring that the reports your social your um, investigators are making? How do you go about ensuring that they're being honest in those? They're truthful. Well, as you pull out the file and you're looking at everything together, it's what supporting evidence do they have? What conversations have been had? Um, you know, who else is a party to it? Who else has information? And is everyone pretty much on the same page where it's going? Does anything stand out that you want to question? Um, going back to this particular case, you had a referral that there were some allegations back in Japan several months prior. Did that stand out in your mind as a potential red flag about there might be something odd here? About Japan? I'm sorry. Uh -huh. Yes. Okay, how so? Because you have the military telling you that this is something that they've addressed with this family in the past and they are concerned at that time. They were telling us that they had concerns about the safety of these children. Yeah, but they were also telling you that it was several months prior, correct? True. <laughs> that didn't stand out in your mind as being kind of odd? No, because they had come from overseas and relocated to the United States. That could take some time. Have you ever learned or been trained that uh, evidence of a past injury inflicted is an insufficient basis to remove a child without first obtaining a court order? Two parts to that. The court order, no. Okay. Past injury, if it's been investigated and negated, then yes, you wouldn't bring it forward. The information we had was it was still ongoing. And what did you do to follow up to make sure that the information you had was accurate before these children were removed from their home? The conversations with Mr. France or Francis, whichever his name is, at the, at the advocacy center. And you made a record of those somewhere? 
those conversations? You made a record of those somewhere? I don't believe I did. Okay, and we know the rule is if it's not documented somewhere, it didn't happen, right? That's correct. So we should be able to talk to Mr. France or Francis, and he'll be able to tell us what, if anything, happened there. Yes. But you never did call anybody in Japan, correct? I did not. And to your knowledge, Miss Wagner did not do so either, correct? That is correct. Okay. I'm going to show you number 20. Well, let, let me ask you this first. Is that exhibit number 22, to your knowledge, a true, accurate, and complete depiction of the petition worksheet that was sent to the AG's office back in May 2013. And while she's looking at that, here's exhibit number 23. The next one's up. It's a clear report of what Ms. Wagner had been reporting, yes. Okay, and to your recollection, is that a complete and accurate depiction of the uh, document as it would appear in your files or your oh, computer system? Yes. Okay. Now, what? Oh, it fell. get to exhibit number 23. Part, part of your duties as a program manager now include discipline, disciplining your subordinate social workers, correct? Or rather your subordinate staff, correct? Correct. Okay. And you may approve discipline for a variety of different policy violations, correct? Correct. Or ethical violations, right? Correct. Or even legal violations, right? Correct. Have you ever yourself disciplined a worker for any, in any way, for conducting a school interview of a child without parental consent or a court order? No. Okay. Have you ever disciplined a subordinate worker in any way for removing or seizing a child from its parents' custody under circumstances where there was no immediate danger to the child? No. Have you ever disciplined one of your subordinate workers in any way for removing a child where there was no evidence that the child was likely to suffer severe bodily injury or death within a very short period of time? No. Would you, would you discipline a worker if they did something like that? If they removed a child from its, the custody of its parents in the absence of any evidence to suggest that the child would suffer immediate and severe bodily injury or death Check the absent, form. absent the intervention. Check the form foundation. Join. Incomplete hypothetical. If a worker was to go out and just remove a child without having staffed it or discussed or taken some of the steps that they need to do just on their own with Nothing else? Yes. Okay. But you've never actually done that. Well, let me explain what that would mean. It would mean staffing it with my supervisor and submitting paperwork to HR who would look into it. So it wouldn't always mean it's something I'm specifically doing. We would get direction. Mm -hmm. So you make disciplinary recommendations? True. Okay. Have you ever made that sort of disciplinary recommendation? No. 
and based on your answer, let's make sure I understand this correctly, is that any time that one of your subordinates seizes a child from the custody of its parents, there should be agreement between that particular worker and their supervisor, for sure, and possibly one more level up in the chain of command? That's correct. Okay. So all three of those people then would be participating in the decision to remove a child from the custody of its parents? Yes. And if there were any issue with the removal, then it would be all three of those people or all of the participants in making the decision who would be responsible for the decision, correct? That's correct. And if the decision were the wrong decision, they would be responsible for that too, correct? That's correct. Okay. All right. Did we already show you number 22? I think I did, right? Yeah. Show you exhibit number 23. That is the dependency petition and petition for paternity or child support. That's good. And do you recognize that document? I do. And just so the record's clear, it bears Bates numbers AZ CPSF 000285 through and including AZ CPSF 000303, correct? Correct. Okay. If you look at the last page, it's internal page number 18. Towards the bottom of the page, there's a signature there. Do you recognize that signature? I do not. Then right above that signature, there's your name, right? On the last page? Should be. Oh, no, that's Karen Wagner. I'm sorry. I was getting ahead of myself. Uh, far ahead of myself. Okay. And you recognize this document, right? Yes. What is it? It's the petition that the AG has filed taking information from the worksheet and submitted it to the court. Okay, and we spoke about this a little bit earlier. The second to the last page, number 302. Okay. That's the verification that Ms. Wagner signed under penalty of perjury, correct? Correct. Okay. And am I correct that in before she signs the verification, she's required, Ms. Wagner is required to review this document, this petition, to ensure that all the factual statements made in it are truthful, honest, accurate, and complete, correct? That is correct. Okay. Have you ever disciplined a worker for signing a verification where the petition contained false allegations? I personally... Ask an answer. Go ahead. I personally have not, but I have heard of a circumstance where it's happened. Okay. Why would you discipline the worker if it's the AG writing the petition? Because it's the information coming from the worker. Well, doesn't the AG also sign the petition? Yes, or their name's on it. Have you ever heard of an attorney general being disciplined in any way? Foundation. For, have, you have to wait for the question, sir. Have you ever heard of an AG, an attorney with the AG's office, ever being disciplined in any way for uh, putting false information in a juvenile dependency petition? Foundation. I have not, but I don't think I would. Now, at some point in time, the court had a hearing on the allegations set forth in this petition, correct? Correct. 
Did you attend any of the hearings? No, I did not. Did you hear anything about any of the hearings? Not a, no. Nobody ever told you that the court found Miss Wagner to not be credible? Objection. Assumes testimony. I have not been told, heard that from the court or anyone, no. Did you ever review any of the court transcripts of the hearings in the Pellerin case? No, we don't. We would have to request access for transcripts. We only get um, minute entries. So the answer to my question would be no, you've never reviewed any of the transcripts? No. Okay, would it surprise you to find out that not just once, but twice the judge in the Pellerin matter stated on the record that he specifically found Miss Wagner to not be credible? Yes, that would surprise me. Okay, let's see if we can get there. Before we do though, um, if I can get you to look at page 296 of exhibit number 23. Okay. Right there. Okay, the fourth paragraph down under request for relief, it says the ADES made reasonable efforts to prevent removal of the children from the home. First, did I read that correctly? Yes. What were the specific efforts made by your agency to prevent the removal of the children from the home? By implementing a safety plan. That was the voluntary safety plan? Yes. Okay. The one that uh, later, because it was alleged the grandparents breached it, that's the same safety plan that was in effect at that point in time when the kids were removed from the grandparents, right? Yes. Okay. Same safety plan where you did not first seek a court order before removing the children from the grandparents, correct? Yes. Were those the only efforts? Is the safety plan? Yes. Exhibit number 32. I'm going to pass that around. And while they're looking at exhibit number 32, I'm going to show you exhibit number 28 and ask you to look at that. And then let me know if you recognize it. I do recognize it. And what is it? It is the initial report to the juvenile court. And by initial report to the juvenile court, what does that mean? The first report for the first hearing. Okay. Do you know procedurally when that report gets filed? Well, best case scenario would be... ...24 to 48 hours prior to a hearing, but that often doesn't happen. Okay. And in um, putting this report together, whose responsibility is it to make sure it gets put together properly and filed? The investigator. Okay. Do, um, well, if you turn to page number 272, it's the last page there, yes. page number 16. And it says, approved by name title, Lynn Hart, CPS supervisor. Is that you? That's me. Did you actually approve this report? I did. Hey, I don't see a signature here. Do you know if there's a reason for that? No, I w would have thought there would have been signed copies. Do you recall signing it? I don't recall, but I don't know why I wouldn't have unless, but there are times when court reports get to the court without a supervisor's signature, so okay. it could go either way. Now, in looking through this um, initial dependency hearing report, 
does this appear to be a true, accurate, and complete depiction of the report that you signed back on May 28th, 2013? It appears to be, yes. Okay. Now, this is an official document, right? Yes. It's one um, that when you file it with the court, you expect the, the court to accept it into evidence, right? That's correct. And you expect the court, when it accepts this report into evidence, to take everything in the report as true, correct? That's correct. And you have a affirmative obligation in putting this or in approving this report to actually ensure that the contents of the report are truthful, honest, accurate, and complete, correct? Say that again? Sure, can I have it reread, please? Do you have an affirmative obligation in putting this or in approving this report to actually ensure that the contents of the report are truthful, honest, accurate, and complete, correct? My immediate answer is yes. However, it doesn't mean that if there was additional information, I have the information I have from Ms. Wagner. I'm not sure I understand that. I'm sure that came out cloudy. Um, Can, hold, hold on, hold on. Can I get the question and the answer reread, please? And you have an affirmative obligation in putting this or in approving this report to actually ensure that the contents of the report are truthful, honest, accurate, and complete, correct? My immediate answer is yes. However, it doesn't mean that if there was additional information, I have the information I have from this way. Okay, let me, let me try it this way. At the time that you approve the report, I'm not talking about later if additional information comes in. At the time that you approve the report, Am I correct that you have an affirmative obligation before approving it to ensure that its contents are truthful, honest, accurate, and complete? Yes. Okay. And one of the reasons for that is because the court is going to accept this report into evidence and rely on this report in coming to its conclusions, correct? Correct. And that's why we want a second pair of eyes on it before it gets filed, right? Correct. And when we're talking about truthful, honest, accurate, and complete, that complete portion, and we talked about this a little bit earlier, that would include the exculpatory information, right? Yes. That is the information that would undermine or negate the allegations in both the petition and maybe even within the body of this report. Correct. So for example, if uh, by May 28th a forensic examination or actually a forensic interview had been done and the children had, had denied all of the allegations, the, those statements should appear here in this report, right? Those denials? If, it, if the evaluation was prior to the 28th when this report was written, yes, it should be in there. Okay. And also, like the forensic medical examinations that came back, if they said, for example, that any bruising on either of the children was nonspecific and uh, they didn't appear to have any injuries, that should also be here in the report somewhere, right? Yes. Okay. And if you can turn to page 258, that's internal page 2 of the report. And just for the record, we're still on exhibit number 28. The second sentence in the sixth paragraph down says, based on concerns during the initial investigation. Do you see that? I'm looking. Okay. Page two, sixth paragraph. Yeah, the paragraph begins with case manager Karen Wagner. Okay. Okay. Then it says, uh, the second sentence in says, based on concerns during the initial investigation, the family was placed on a safety plan until further investigation could be completed to ensure the safety of the children. First, did I read that correctly? Yes. Okay. 
based on concerns during the initial investigation. What specific concerns arose during the initial investigation? Well, going back to here in the CSRA, there were several concerns. There was the concern of the, the quote-unquote military discipline. There was the concerns of spanking continually um, with a belt or spoon. There was the concerns of Japan. There was concerns that the daughter was asked to be a parent to the younger child. There was, there was concerns that the children had been told, or at least one of them had been told not to say anything. And then the last concern would have been the, well, the violation of the safety plan, but that's not against the parents. Why would it not be against the parents? Well, what I mean is that was the grandparents that violated the safety plan, not not the mom or dad. Well, I thought the allegation in violation of the safety plan was that the dad took the kids shooting. Right? Yes, but true. So but wouldn't that be against the parents? True. Or at least a parent? Yes. Does that appear somewhere here in this report, that story about the dad taking the kids shooting? If you recall, I mean, I can read I don't it. know. I don't recall. When, when's the last time you read this report? Probably back in May of 2013. Have you yourself ever disciplined any of your subordinate workers for putting untruthful statements in a report of this kind, one of these, uh, what do you call this thing, initial dependency hearing reports? Not for court reports, but for case notes, yes. Okay. Well, the case notes don't go to the court, right? If they're subpoenaed, they can. Okay. In this case, did any of the case notes go to the court? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Let's just focus for a moment. The question is only in relation to court reports. Have you ever disciplined one of your subordinates in any way for um, making false statements in a court report? I have not. Have you ever heard of anybody making false statements in a court report? I have not. Have you ever heard any parent complaints about workers making false statements in court reports? I've heard of parents complaining against a case manager, but I have not received a complaint that of a false documentation. What about incomplete reports? Have you ever disciplined uh, any subordinate worker for omitting material exculpatory evidence from a court report? I have not. Okay. Have you ever heard of a worker being disciplined anywhere in the state, for that matter, for omitting material exculpatory evidence from a court report? I have not heard of that. Okay. If I can get you to turn to page 259, that's internal page number three, second paragraph. It says, in reports that she gets spanked with a wooden stick, and during one incident in Japan, she reports that she, quote, had bruises all over, end quote. Are you there? I'm there. Did I read that correctly? Yes. Who did you report this to? Miss Wagner. That's your understanding, is that actually said these words during her interview with Miss Wagner? I believe so, yes. Did you ever read any of those uh, documents that came from Japan where similar statements were made by other people? I did read the statements, but I don't recall them right now. Do you know whether or not in her forensic interview supported this? She said, oh yeah, that happened, or words to that effect. No, I believe in, in her forensic interview she denied it. Mm -hmm. You just didn't believe her. Nobody believed her when she was denying it. Form argumentative. Is that right? 
say that again? Yeah, no, nobody believed when she was denying all these, this parade of horrible events. Nobody believed her when she denied it. I can't answer for what they believed or didn't believe. There was concern. Well, did you believe it? When you heard about it, her denials, did you believe her? I was concerned over the statement that her mom had told her not to say anything, so I didn't know whether it would, you know, whether it's accurate or not accurate. Well, did she say, did she say in her interview, oh, by the way, my mom told me not to say anything, or is that something that Ms. Uh, Wagner put in her report? That's something that Ms. Wagner said. Okay, and again, when we have a situation like that, you have the word of your investigator versus the word of the victim, you're going to go with your investigator, right? Check form, assumes facts. Am I right about that? I don't have an answer for that. Well, you told me earlier in the day, didn't you, that Ms. Wagner, was, she was a good investigator. That's correct. Mm -hmm. And as a good investigator, now that everybody's reviewed exhibit number 32. Let me ask you, I'm sorry. Sure. I, I'm trying to make a, do we have like a time for a two minute break? Is this a good time to do it? I need to make a call before 3.30 apparently. It's 3.18 apparently. Cool. I'll be really quick with okay. this and we can finish it later. I just want to get started on it. If you can look at exhibit number 32. And this sort of goes back to the issue of uh, whether or not you recall the court finding that Ms. Wagner lacked credibility. If I can get you to turn to page 1371, okay. exhibit 32. Towards the bottom of the page there, it starts with the court. It says, well, you know, counsel, one of the things that I do as a judicial officer is I assess the credibility of witnesses as they testify in light of the evidence that's presented. This particular investigator, in my estimation, was not a credible witness. First, did I read that correctly? You did. Do you know who he's talking about when he says this particular investigator? I'm assuming it's Ms. Wagner. Well, why do you assume that? She was the assigned investigator of the case. And there were no other investigators on the case? No. Uh, no, there were no others? or No, there were no others. Okay. And it says, uh, continues on on page 1372, I will tell you what I believed happened with her. When she presented at the home of the respondents and they didn't jump to, she was ticked off. And I'm going to use the word ticked off as opposed to the word I would normally use. But I'm on the record and I'm in court. She was ticked off. She wasn't going to have it. And she made up her mind she was going to show these people who was in charge. Now that's what happened. Did I read that right? You did. Are you still talking about Ms. Wagner there? Object foundation. As far as you know? As far as I know. Okay, we go ahead and take a break. Okay. That is 320 p.m. off the record. Have you ever uh, heard from any source any similar complaint about Miss Wagner as the judge was making here in exhibit number uh, 32? Can I ask something? Sure. This was written by the judge? Uh, this is a transcript of the proceedings. Gotcha. If you it's look not something at, I'm familiar with. Yeah, if, it, if you look at uh, page number 1361. Okay. Where it says, before the oh, Honorable see. L. Grant, transcript of proceedings, date June 14th, 2013. You see that there? Yes, sorry. I didn't yeah, no problem. get that. Okay, question again, I'm sorry. Um, have you ever heard anybody, other, other than Judge Grant here, have you ever heard anybody make similar complaints about Ms. Wagner? No. Okay. Here on page 1372, <clears throat> Judge Grant goes on to say, you know, I've been a judge for a while and I assess human nature and judgment. I can read between the lines and I know that's what happened here. What she did was she made, she wrote a target on these people's back and she filled in the gaps. She'd already made up her mind this was going to happen. She made up her mind. 
And this is just simply not the way we should conduct business. These people have rights. And it is the considered opinion of this court that this investigator has trampled upon these good people's rights. First, did I read all that correctly? You did. Have you ever heard this before from any source? No, and in a situation similar to this, in a s different situation, this information was passed down through the AG to myself. What do you mean? In another case, another situation, not with Ms. Wagner, that a judge had concerns about a, a worker, the information was shared with us, and I've never seen this before today. So the Attorney General's office didn't come and, and share this judge's findings with I have you? never seen this before today. Okay. Do you have any understanding as to whether or not uh, Ms. Wagner was ordered to appear in front of Judge Grant for a contempt proceeding? No. Now, we talked about this a little bit earlier in the day. And you know what? Before we get to that, let's, let's go back to what the judge is talking about here. Now, when he says, I'll tell you what I believed happened with her when she presented at the home of the respondents and they didn't jump to she was ticked off. Do you know whether or not here the judge is referring to Miss Wagner's visit to the Pellerin home on May 10th, 2013? Objection Foundation. Join. I'm assuming so. Why do you assume that? Because that's when she responded in the investigation to their home. Okay, so let's talk about that a little bit. She went to her home. We'd started this process earlier, but got a little bit distracted. She went to the home after she interviewed at school, right? Correct. And she began her interview with the mother, Angie Pellerin, correct? Correct. And at that point in time, only Miss Pellerin and the children were home, correct? I don't know that, it, did, possibly. Did you speak with Miss Wagner on the telephone at any point in time during that first interview with Miss Pellerin? It was when, no, when I spoke to her that she was waiting to speak to them because they were having dinner. Okay. When she called you, Ms. Wagner called you on the phone and explained that she was waiting to speak to them while they had, because they were having dinner, did she also explain to you that she had gotten to the home, she began her interview with the mother, but then the mother had to take a break to prepare dinner because it was near dinner time? Did Ms. Wagner explain that to you? Similar, yes. Okay. Did she also explain to you that uh, despite the fact that the interview had already begun, Ms. Pellerin just would not finish the interview, she had to prepare dinner and ask Ms. Wagner to wait? Yes. Okay. And when Ms. Wagner was explaining this to you, do you remember her tone? tone of voice? Was she happy? Was she angry? Was she upset? Do you remember? I don't think she was happy that she was going to have to wait a while to get to the, you know, the interview finished. Mm -hmm. Now by the time she went out there to the interview, um, she had already spoken with at school. She already had the information from the military and she already had a portion of her interview completed, right? At the time she called you? Yes. Okay. And we know from that earlier report that her interview with at school happened sometime around 2.20 p.m., correct? Yes. Okay. 
do you recall about what time it was that Miss Wagner called you to let you know that the investigation was going to take longer than expected because the mother was uh, preparing dinner and waiting for the father? I would be guesstimating. I am just know it was the evening hours. Okay. And when Miss Wagner called you, was she inside the home or was she out in her car, if you recall? She was outside. I don't believe she was in the car. Did she uh, express to you that she had told the, the parents uh, that they would have 10 more minutes? She did not express that to me, but I did read that in the CSRA. Okay. And what was it that was going to happen if the parents didn't jump to and give her the interview in 10 minutes? I don't know. Did she talk to you about that? What no. should I do? No. Okay. She never asked you, what should I do if they don't hop right to it and give me my interview? The conversation was that she was going to wait for them to finish dinner and then she would complete her interviews as best she could. Okay. How many times did she call you that day relative to this investigation? I'm not sure. I know she called when she was waiting and I believe she called I'm not sure. I think she called on her way home, but I, I'm not sure. What do you mean on her way home? You mean on her way home that night after she had completed the uh, removal process? The Get safety form, Ms. State's testimony, in fact. Go ahead. The safety plan? Uh huh. So procedurally, she would have called after she was done interviewing and saying that these were still her concerns and that they were going to implement a safety plan. I just don't recollect that at this moment. That's what should have happened. I'm thinking it did. Okay. Do you know whether or not uh, when she called you, when she was waiting out in her car for uh, the Pellerins to finish dinner, do you know whether or not the military representatives were on site yet? I know somebody was on site. I thought it was Buckeye, but I could be misspoken on that. So I know somebody was with her. Okay. You just don't know who. I don't know who. Do you know if she went out to the home with somebody or if they met her there? They would have met her there. And would they have met her there before she began her interview with uh, Miss Angie Pellerin or would it have been later? Foundation. Uh, if you know. I don't know. Do you recall her telling you anything? And by her, I mean Miss Wagner. Again, I know somebody was with her. I just don't know if it was PD or if it was military. I don't, so that would. Did Miss Wagner ever call you and tell you that she saw bruises on the children that evening? She said that she had seen what she thought was grab marks. On who? The daughter. And what part of the daughter's, that would, that would have been correct? Yes. What part of the daughter's body, body did she see these alleged grab marks on? Upper arms. Did you document this conversation with Ms. Wagner anywhere? No. Do you know whether or not Ms. Wagner documented her conversation with you? I would think it would have all been in her handwritten notes as they keep a chronological order of everything that they're doing. Mm -hmm. Did she uh, talk to you about any other injuries on besides these supposed grab marks? She did not. Okay. How about the little boy? Just the initial red mark she said she saw on the forehead. Did she tell you what the explanation for that red mark on the forehead was? She said he said that the dog had knocked him down or ran into him. And did she express to you uh, any belief that she thought he was lying to her about that? She did not say anything like that. Any other injuries that she talked to you about on? No. Did she tell you on the telephone that she was going to call the police to have them come out and take pictures of the children? No, it, it, if she had seen the injuries at school, 
I would have thought that would have been coordinated at the time she was going out there, not once she got to the home. Did she, when you, you talked to her, uh, I don't remember, did you talk to her after her interview at school? I don't recall. Okay. Do you remember talking to her at any point in time um, between the time she's out in her car telling you she had to wait and the time that the police showed up and started taking pictures? No, my recollection is that that was the conversation I had. We were talking about it while she was waiting for the parents to finish dinner. She's telling me about the alleged bruise on the daughter, um, what the child had said, then, and I don't know who was with her, um, and then I, I'm pretty sure there would have been follow-up afterwards because I remember at this time also talking with my supervisor by phone. And again, your supervisor at that point in time was who? Sharon Kanick. That's right. What would have happened at that point in time, at least according to your training and expectations, what would have happened at that point in time if Ms. Pellerin had just said, no, get out of my house, I'm not going to talk to you. Leave. Closer speculation. According to policy, what would have been the appropriate response to that by Ms. Wagner? Some facts and calls for speculation. I would have um, told her I would staff this with my supervisor and make the following, you know, make a determination on what steps we were going to take next. He wouldn't go get a court order? No. Unless that, no. no. Well, how would, how would you get access then? How would you get into the home to talk to these parents and these children? Mm -hmm. And goes for speculation. Well, we had the interview with the daughter, and it is a lot of speculation. It's a lot of what if. Um, if if they wouldn't have let us in, we could have went to the courts at that point and said we're concerned about this. So there was a process in place back in 2013 whereby you could go to the courts and get an order to gain access to a home to interview a child? No, it would have been to remove a child. It would have been similar to the pickup order. It wouldn't have been just to interview. What, what do we call that type of order? A pickup order. And is there a specific uh, policy in place to provide for a mechanism for you to go in and get a court order when the parent denies you access to the home? Well, there's two different things. There's this pickup order there's also serving a TCN that gives us six hours to interview a child if we felt that was necessary as well. Yeah, but a TCN is not a court order, right? Correct. That's just... Touche. Yeah, that's just one of your... It's what we have. ...workers making a decision. But discretion. that's what we would have done. If we felt we needed to remove a child, like, for some reason, that's what we would have done. How do you enforce that? Do you go out there with police and sort of use them like the muscle to enforce the order? <laughs> Sometimes the police are with us and sometimes they're not. You ever have a circumstance uh, where one of your subordinates showed up to uh, serve a TCN and the parent refused? Said, no, I'm not going to give you my kid? Yes. What do you do in that circumstance? Gone back to the office, staffed it with the attorney general, staffed it with our direct chain of command and filed a petition for a pickup order. Okay. So if a parent refuses, you do have a mechanism to, to actually go get an order from the court to remove the child. If we feel, yes, if we feel that the child's unsafe and the AG support that, yes. Okay, and you've done that before? I have done that before. How long did that take for you to get that pickup order? When you go out with a Could TCN, the parent refuses, said, no, nah, you're not taking my kid. You go back, you staff it with the AG, you file some sort of papers to get a pickup order. How long did that process take? It's hard to say because 
if you're talking it's say it's at six o'clock at night you're not going to be talking to your attorney probably to the following day um, it, it could be two three four days well the one that you did have you done it more than once Yes, but I don't. I, I can tell you what the process was that we did. We we called the AGs and told them what the concerns were. We staffed it up our chain of command and said this is what our issue is. And our chain of command gave us the go ahead to talk to the AGs. We let them know and they tell us if they believe we have enough to do that to okay. file a petition. Okay. And how long did it take you in that process? Oh, I can't. I, two or three, four days. I don't know. It's not a common thing. Now, these, these children with this family, as of May 10th, they'd been back in the U.S. for, what, about three months or so, four months? I don't recall. Okay. But there were no reported injuries to the children at all since they returned to the United States, right? My understanding, not that I'm aware of. Okay. So what would have been the harm in taking an extra two to four days to go get a court order to remove these children? If that would have been the direction that our chain of command would have offered, that's what we would have followed. With the information coming from Japan, there was concern that we didn't have the time to wait. We had to react based on what we were being told. Can I have the question reread, please? So what would have been the harm in taking an extra two to four days to go get a court order to remove these children? Yeah, what would have been the what would have been the harm in waiting an additional two to four days that it would take to go get a court order to remove these children? Because of the potential abuse situation that we were hearing of from Japan, the one that happened months ago. Yes. When there had been no current reports of any kind of abuse. That's correct. Form. Okay. What was the specific injury? The specific injury that you were attempting to avert that night on May 10th, 2013 by removing the children from their parents' home and putting them in grandparents' home? There was no specific injury on that night. Okay. And it's the same with respect to the removal from the grandparents' home later on or about May 21st, 2013. You had no specific injury that you were trying to avert, no specific danger, right? Well, the information provided was that they had violated the safety plan. Okay, and that was the shooting incident where they went out, took the kids shooting, right? Correct. What was the specific danger to the children? What was it? The same thing that we were dealing with, with the information from Japan. We didn't have clarification one way or another that it was happened, didn't happen, resolved, okay. factual, not factual. Let, let me try this again. I'm not asking for the information you had from Japan. I'm asking... When you remove those children, there's an axe that's falling. It's immediate. There's an immediate danger. My God, the kid's going to get hurt. What was it that night? There was nothing that night other than direction from our management. Okay. And with respect to any potential injury or potential harm, that was speculation on your part, right, as to future harm? You, you were speculating that because this thing happened three, four months ago in Japan or allegedly happened three or four months ago in Japan, something might happen in the future here, right? Based on the pattern of what we were hearing, correct. Okay. Have you ever been trained that at least in the Ninth Circuit, speculative injury or speculative danger is an insufficient basis to remove a child from the custody of its parents? you ever learned that? Dick Foreman Foundation. Join. I have heard that. When? When did you hear that? I couldn't tell you. Was it sometime within the last year? No, it's probably during the times of core training. So all the way back to 1997? Sure. So am I correct then, ma'am, that you would have known throughout your career, in fact, that speculation about future injury or future harm does not give you a basis to remove a child from the custody of its parents? I understand that. It, the decision was not based solely on Ms. Wagner and myself. Move to strike is non-responsive. Can I get my question reread, please? Mm -hmm. So am I correct then, ma'am, that you would have 
known throughout your career, in fact, that speculation about future injury or future harm does not give you a basis to remove a child from the custody of its parents. Correct. Okay. And in fact, you have known throughout your career, all the way back to 1997, that absent specific and articulable evidence to show that the child is likely to suffer severe bodily injury or death within a very short period of time, you cannot remove that child from the custody of its parents. At least not without a court order. Correct. Okay. And you knew that on uh, May 10th, 2013, right? Yes. You also knew that on May 21st, on or about May 21st, 2013, right? Yes. And you also knew that, what was it, June 13th, 2013, at 7.42 p.m., right? Correct. I'm going to show you exhibit number 62 to your deposition. Okay, before we get on to exhibit number 62, I've got a couple other questions. Do you know whether or not the Attorney General's office has a duty attorney on call to um, pursue court orders when they might be needed? I know they do now. I do not know if they did in 2013. At what point in time, if you know, did they start having a attorney on call? I don't know. Was that sort of concurrent with this new training that you talked about earlier uh, today, the 2016 training? Asked and answered. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know. Okay, but you, you do know that now, as of today, there is somebody on call at the AG's office so that if you have an evening or nighttime situation, Correct. you got to finish. Sorry. You do know now today that there is somebody on duty at the AG's office so that if one of your workers does have a nighttime situation where they need to get a hold of an attorney to potentially process one of these removal orders or pickup orders, there is somebody available for that. Correct. Okay. How about a duty judge? Do you know whether or not there's a duty judge on call and available to hear those motions or applications? I don't know about the judges. Okay. And speaking for today, how long, if you know, according to your training, does it take from the point that you call one of these on-call attorneys to the point that you actually get the pickup order? How long does that take? As soon as, as, as they go ahead. As soon as they file it. So that would be on them how quick they file it. Okay. Is there a particular person at the AG's office that you guys are supposed to call, or does it sort of rotate and vary? We do have a duty AG, that, a duty AG number that we call during the day. Um, I think that they do have a rotation of AGs for evening and weekends. Okay. Okay. And then with respect to this, a uh, question about whether or not Miss Wagner was ordered ordered to appear before Judge Grant um, at a contempt proceeding. Is that something she would have been required to report to you if it happened? Yeah. Assumes facts. Go ahead. I, I would. I would think I would know. Yes. Okay. But you never heard about anything like that ever happening. 
I don't remember. I mean, in this case. I don't remember a contempt hearing. I don't know if it was something maybe when I was out during that time frame with all that. I, I, I'm i not familiar with that whatsoever. With how, about an order, how about an order to show cause? Are you aware of whether or not the judge uh, ever ordered Ms. Wagner to appear and show cause why his earlier order returning the children to their home wasn't followed? I don't you remember. You have to form the state's act. I don't remember. Doesn't mean it didn't happen. I just don't remember. Okay. Okay, now going on to exhibit number 62. Okay. And if you just let me know if you recognize that. The temporary custody notice. Okay, and the date on that? June 13th. Okay, and we talked a little bit about this earlier. Is that the temporary custody notice that was... Uh, put together and served in relation to that email we talked about between Ms. Wagner and Mr. Burns? That's what it appears to be. I didn't have any part of this, but that's what it looks like, yes. So at this point, your approval was no longer required for that temporary custody notice, am I correct? You get to form Ms. State's testimony. Well, well let's, let's back up, hold on a second. As we talked about this earlier in the day, and maybe I, I misunderstood. Um, Any time that your social worker is going to, not social worker, I'm sorry, you guys call them something different out here. Any time that one of your subordinates is going to remove a child from the custody of its parents, they're going to serve the parent with a temporary custody notice, right? Correct. And before they do that, they're going to staff the case with you and consult as to whether or not that should happen, correct? Correct. Okay. And that's in just about every case, right? Absolutely. Okay. On this particular one, you just testified that she did not staff and consult with you. Ms. Wagner did not staff and consult with you before serving this temporary custody notice, correct? Asked and answered. If this is from when the when she was directed by management to go out and refile, she, I wasn't there to staff with. She would have staffed with somebody else. Okay. Do you know who? Could have been an answer. Go ahead. Any one of those people that were attached to that email. Okay. And had she staffed with one of those people, is that something that would be reflected in her case notes? Yes, and it could, if that email was in the case notes, it would be reflected that way, or if there's emails in the hard file, it would be reflected that way, yes. What do you mean emails in the hard file? That email that we had earlier with the discussion, if it was in the hard file, then it's reflected. I'm having trouble here. I know there's the CSRA, and that has data in it. And then there's the case notes, and that has data in it. Are you telling me now that there's also a hard file? Yes, there is a hard file. And when you say hard file, you mean it's not on a computer, it's actually a paper file? Correct. Okay. And if I were to ask you to produce to me the entirety of that hard file, what would I call it so that you would know exactly what I'm talking about? Foundation. Go ahead. Hard file. And you know whether or not that hard file is still maintained on this case by the state of Arizona? I would believe so. I would think that it had um, has been taken out of the storage and is somewhere. I can't tell you where it's at, but yeah, we keep things until children age out of the system. Okay. And the hard file, you know, some of these exhibits we've looked at today, they, they don't have signatures on them. Mm -hmm. Would the document in the hard file have a signature? I would hope so. Okay. What types of documents would we find in the hard file? Copies of anything here that you're looking at, temporary custody notices, anything relating to the investigation, services provided, um, if there was counseling, counseling notes, if there was a psychological, psychological evaluations, pictures, anything related to the case would go into the hard file. It's in paper form. What about handwritten notes? They don't keep handwritten notes in the files. Is that as a matter of policy, they don't keep handwritten notes? I don't know if it's policy, 
it's always been understood that once you get everything entered into the CSRA, because they're your notes and there could be things that are different written on your hand notes or your own jargon or whatever that aren't put in their um, smiley faces or shorthand terminology or whatever. Let's focus for a minute on things that are different in your handwritten notes. Wouldn't it be important if there's things different in your handwritten notes that those be maintained or that it somehow make its way into the system? Well, I think what I'm referring to is like a shorthand. Um, there's a global assessment that's completed and so if you're asking someone, have you ever been a victim of child abuse? So a worker may write CA for child abuse and answer no, knowing that when they go type it up, they're going to put that in more of a structured sentence and they're not going to write exactly what was on their hand note. Okay. You know who Lynn Pacino is? I do not. You ever you recall ever receiving a letter from Lynn Pacino? That name does not ring a bell. All right. Let's see if I can refresh you. Well, I'll show you what will mark as exhibit number twenty-one. It's your deposition. And it'll take a minute. Somebody's got a log. about exhibit 21 I'm going to show you guys exhibits number 58 and 36 as well. Okay there's exhibit number 21. Okay do you recognize that exhibit number 21? I don't. Do you recall ever, well, let's look right on the first page there. It says, attention, Karen Wagner, CPS Specialist 2, Supervisor Lynn Hart. I see that. Do you have any reason to believe that this letter was not sent to you? No, I do have reason to believe that if it was sent to the fax number at the at the Southwest Family Advocacy Center, a copy was printed out and I would assume given to Miss Wagner. This fax number six two three 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 zero seven nine zero. Do you recognize that number? I don't, but the three three threes are the Avondale fax numbers, so it would have been Avondale office it went to. And you were a supervisor out of the Avondale office? I was at the Advocacy Center. And where was that? Over on um, Estrella Boulevard, the Southwest Family Advocacy Center. Would it have not been the practice for somebody receiving this at the Avondale office with your name on it to go ahead and forward it to you? If one fax came out, what I'm assuming is that they saw Karen Wagner and they forwarded it to her and, and not made like two copies or anything. And Karen Wagner, was she uh, also at the Advocacy Center or was she at Avondale? Advocacy Center. Now, you said as her supervisor, you regularly staff and consult on the cases and the goings on in a case, right? Correct. So when she received this letter, is this something that she would have staffed and consulted with you about? 
Yes, and more importantly, she would have gotten with the Attorney General's office and shared the information with them. Can you see the uh, second paragraph down? The fourth sentence in, it's all in italics, says the United States Air Force Family Services confirmed that the allegations were unsubstantiated. Do you see that? I do see that. Um, and this was faxed, it says, on May 23rd, 2013, right? Correct. Then there's a time date stamp up in the upper part of that uh, page 723 that confirms that it was 1504 was the time this was faxed? Correct. Okay. So am I correct that by May 23rd, 2013, at least Ms. Wagner was already being informed that there was a contention that the U.S. Air Force found the allegations were unsubstantiated. Form. Am I correct about that? Foreman also calls for speculation. Join. This document does say that the Air Force has confirmed the allegations are unsubstantiated. Okay, so somewhere in the case notes or the CSRA or somewhere, we should see that Ms. Pacino is making the claim that the Air Force, the allegations that were investigated by the Air Force were found to be unsubstantiated, right? Yes. And that information should also make its way into the petition and the initial hearing report, right? Yes. Because that would be exculpatory information, right? Correct. Object to form assumes facts. Your answer was? Yes. Okay. At a minimum, you would expect somebody to try to figure out whether or not this was a true statement, wouldn't you? That the United States Air Force Family Services confirmed that the allegations were unsubstantiated. Isn't that something an investigator is supposed to confirm? Yes. Do you have any understanding as to whether or not Ms. Wagner did anything ever to confirm the truth or lack of truth of that statement there? No, I, I don't know who, based on this solely, like if we were calling Mr. France, that was not something that we had heard because that's contradictory to what we were being told. Well, Mr. France, again, we know if it doesn't appear in the case notes or the CSRA, if he didn't document it, it didn't happen, right? That's correct. So my question is, did anybody, to your knowledge, ever do anything to verify whether or not this statement was true? The statement being that the United States Air Force Family Services confirmed that the allegations were unsubstantiated. And my statement is that we did check just because there's not a case note doesn't mean we didn't check. We were in contact with Luke Air Force Base. And you, you recall what four years later specifically following up to see whether or not these allegations were substantiated or unsubstantiated. We, check the form. we kept waiting to get information about whether it had happened or not happened. Well, how was it that Ms. Pacino was able to get this information by as early as May 23rd, 2013? Objective form assumes facts. I don't know. Do you know whether or not the uh, judge, Judge Grant, ever made any specific findings about the truth or veracity of allegations that Ms. Wagner was making against these parents? I don't know what's written in his statement. I know he dismissed the dependency. Do you recall anybody ever telling you that one of the reasons he dismissed the dependency, there were several reasons, but one of them was because he made specific findings that many of the allegations were not true. 
subject for mistakes fact. Join. I don't know. I don't know if if it was ever stated in that fact in that manner. Okay. What I was told initially was the jurisdiction issue. Okay. And who told you that? My supervisor and the DPM at the time, Jeanette Bell. DPM? What's D DPM? In, in between the program manager and the program administrator. Right, that's one that no longer exists. Correct. Okay. Do you recall anybody ever telling you that uh, hold on I'll just read it to you see if that refreshes your recollection this is Judge Grant page 85 of the transcript of proceedings taken June 13th 2013 this was right after uh, Ms. Wagner actually testified. Says, there's a whole string of them actually, we'll just start at page 84. Says uh, line three, the next line, quote, mothers abusing the children and failing to protect them from father's abuse, end quote. Now when I went through here, there was no test testimony this morning about father's abuse. There was some information in these exhibits about some yelling, presumably by mom while father was at work. And there was nothing that would tend to indicate that I have received or seen that father physically abused these children. I, don't, I do not see it. And let me tell you right now, ladies and gentlemen, I looked for it, but I couldn't find it. Quote, mother and father allegedly have inflicted serious physical injuries on both children while the family was sta stationed in Japan, end quote. There was the exhibit number three, the report from the Air Force, and they didn't find anything, and they were there at the scene. And when we do our investigation here in Arizona, I do not see nor could I find anything that would tend to indicate that these parents did anything to these children while they were here in Arizona. So let's just stop right there for a minute. When the judge here at line 16 on page 84, and just so we have a clear record of exhibit 30, which again is the transcript of proceedings taken on June 13th, 2013 at 11.51 a.m. When the judge says that there was an exhibit number three the report from the Air Force, and they didn't find anything, and they were there at the scene. What's he talking about? Object foundation. Joint. Speculation. Well, let's lay the foundation first. You told me earlier in the day, in fact, you've told me several times these reports, you review them before they're filed, right? The court reports? Yeah. Yes. And that includes all the exhibits that they're going to be filed with, right? If there are exhibits, yes. Okay, and well, the judge wouldn't be referencing an exhibit number three if there wasn't an exhibit number three, would he? I wouldn't think so. Okay, so here where he says, there was the exhibit number three, the report from the Air Force, and they didn't find anything, and they were there at the scene. Does that refresh your recollection now about that report that I showed you earlier from the Air Force in Japan where the findings were unsubstantiated? Objective form, misdates fact. Showing. It does not. Do you have any understanding at all what the judge is talking about here where he says, there again at page 84 where he says, there was the exhibit number three, the report from the Air Force, and they didn't find anything, and they were there at the scene. Do you have any understanding what the judge is talking about there? Asked and answered, foundation, calls for speculation. Join.
you know, what, the, referring to the report from Japan, if that's what you're talking about. I, I'm asking you. I, I don't know. I don't know what Exhibit 3 is, or I don't know what was attached to the, the court report. I don't know. Am I correct, ma'am, that what you guys did is you only attached the declarations from the reporting parties in Japan to your court report. You didn't attach the findings. Object to foundation misstates the fact and if you know something, I don't... Am I correct about that? That's. I can't say yes or no to that. I don't know what she put on there. I don't... I can't imagine I would sign something with an incomplete report, but I don't know what got sent up. I don't have it. Well, let's see if we can fix that. This is a big one. I was trying not to actually print it. But uh, what I'll do, it's number 24. It's the parent's copy of what was served on them, which does not contain the LCSW's report and findings. So what I'm going to do, I don't know that we necessarily need to print it. Oh, it's 52 pages before. Right, but we're going to need a minute for everybody to look at it before we talk to her about it. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to pass my book around. Exhibit number 24. Take a short break. Again. The time is 4.17 p.m. Off the record. This is exhibit number 24. And I can sort of share this with you if we need to reference it while we're buzzing along here. Time is 4.28 p.m. Back on the record. Okay, ma'am. Off the record, uh, you took a moment to review exhibit number 24, correct? Correct. And what is exhibit number 24? It is the court report with attachments. Okay. And did you have a moment to go through and review the attachments as well? Yes. Looking Before we get into the attachments, looking specifically at page 726 of exhibit number 24, you see some signatures here on the page, right? Correct. And one of them is above Miss Wagner's name. Do you know who that is? Yes, it was S. Hill, Stacy Hill. Stacy Hill. What happened to my pen? Hello. Oh, sorry. Stacy Hill. Who's Stacy Hill? Stacy Hill was one of the investigators in my unit at the time when I was a supervisor. Do you know whether or not she did any investigation at all into the Pellerin matter? Not to my knowledge, she did not. Why would she be signing this report if she didn't do the investigation? The foundation. If you know. My opinion is that the court report was sent, due to be sent in, and Karen was not there at the moment to sign it, and so they had someone else sign it. Someone who was not familiar with the investigation or the underlying allegations? That's what it looks like. Okay, and then this one here uh, below it, the one that's above your name, do you know who that is? Yeah, that's Lisa Wilson. She was a supervisor with me. Um, so like I said, there was three investigation units. Jackie Cercioni was one of them, and Lisa Wilson was the other supervisor. Okay. Is there a reason why she's signing this instead of you? Again, I must not have been around that, but whenever that was being sent in, I'm not sure. Okay. Do you specifically recall, though, at some point in time before this report was actually filed with the court, do you recall reviewing it? I definitely recall staffing it. I'm not sure that I reviewed it for corrections and, and punctuality. Um, I would think I would have, but without my signature, I can't say that this exact one I reviewed entirely. And then in looking at the attachments to the report, do you recall ever before the report was filed ever having seen any attachments? To it. Well, the TDM summary is what comes out of having the TDM meeting. Mm -hmm. So you would have seen that? Yes. Okay. And beyond the TDM summary, there's... Uh, actually, before we get to that, at seven, page 731 of exhibit number 24, there's a sign-in, what looks like a sign-in sheet there. What is that? That is a sign-in sheet for the TDM. 
And then here, the bottom, after your name, that's your signature there? It is correct. There's three more names after your signature. Do you recognize that handwriting? I don't recognize the handwriting, but I recognize Anthony Francis as being Mr. Francis. And was he actually present at the TDM? He was present by phone. On phone. And do we have a phone number for him? It's not written on there, but I can get one. Okay. And then uh, this next one, Kimberly, what's that say? I'm not sure. It looks like Montero, maybe. Okay. And it looks like she's a clinical social worker. Was she also with the military? Correct. Okay, and that was also on phone. Correct. And the third person there, who's that? That looks like Cynthia Ortega. Do you know who that is? No, she wrote, her title is program assistant. And she was also by phone? Yes. Do you know if she was also with the military? Yes. Okay. It has Luke after her title. Okay, yeah, I see that. How long did this TDM last? Um, they typically last two hours. This one specifically, I would assume around the same time frame. Do you recall anything that either of these three people appearing by telephone had to say? Not offhand. Usually any statements or comments are documented in the, in the TDM summary. Okay, so for example, if we wanted to see, then somebody would have written it down in the TDM summary. Am I understanding you correctly? Right. Okay. There's so one thing that was kind of weird. As I was going through the TDM summary, there's a lot of blank space, like these pages here. Am I correct? Like none of these are filled out on page 729 and then on 730 these services here the participate in parenting classes through family advocacy follow the safety plan that's something that would have come out of the TDM correct okay and at this point in time the TDM is after the safety plan had supposedly been violated, right? Because the children were removed. Object form. Let me, let me ask you this first. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm misunderstanding. A team decision-making meeting, when is that, under what circumstances would one of those typically be held? held? No, there's, there's a lot of different circumstances. It could be when you're considering removing. It could be after a hit or someone has already removed. It could be with the violation of the safety plan. There's permanent okay. CTDMs. There's... And is there a date on this somewhere where we can tell when it was this TDM was held? Maybe on the sign-in sheet? First page, maybe? Somewhere there. 516, 2013. Okay, so that would have been about four days before the um, removal from the grandparents' home, right? Okay, yes. Does that make sense? Because 521 is when they were taken, or at least the temporary custody notice was given, right? Yes. Okay, so then the next thing that we have after the TDM sheet, is it your recollection that this, this TDM report was an attachment to the initial hearing report? It's my... Foundation, go ahead. They would be. Okay, they would be. And then after that, we see this series of statements by witnesses taken in Japan, correct? Correct. Do you recall whether or not, do you, or do you know whether or not these were also attached to the initial hearing report? Foundation. That's why I'm asking, do you know? If you don't know, just I tell me that. I don't know based on the signature, but they should have been. They should have been. If, if they were in the agency's possession, they should have been produced to the court, correct? Correct. And as we flip through here, and we'll just go through them to the very end, I want you to be looking for Mr. Bill Chidekamo's report, the LCSW in Misawa. We want okay. to be looking for his report to see what whether or not that was provided to the court. And we'll just go all the way through to the end here. And 
And let, let me ask you on these witness statements, you guys here in Arizona, you never called any of these witnesses to actually verify the truth and veracity of any of the statements they made, correct? Yeah, that's Foundation. correct. I'm sorry. Your answer was? No. Oh, we join. Right, we did not call. Oh, hold on, let's redo it because I have a video on it and everybody's talking over everybody. I won't be able to, to slice it up for the video clips. Am I correct that here in Arizona, neither you nor any of your workers ever actually called the people that made these statements to verify whether or not the statements were true, correct? Not to my... Okay, hang on. Not to my knowledge. Thank you. Okay, and we'll just keep going through them and getting close to the end here. Okay, that's the end. The last page of Exhibit 24 is 00761. Anywhere in there, did you see that report from Misawa, Japan? No, sir. Okay, the, the one that we looked at together earlier today, it's not part of this, attached to this initial hearing report? No. Okay. Is there a reason that it wouldn't be, but all the witness statements would be? Foundation. If you know. I don't know. I don't know when that por report was received by the agency. Well, we know from looking at the judge's transcript that at least by the time of the hearing, when was that in? The hearing in June, June 13th. At least by that time, we know that the report from the Air Force and they didn't find anything. They were there at the scene. We know that report. The judge knew about it by the, the time of this hearing, right? Objection calls for speculation. According to that, yes. Okay. Do you have any understanding as to how it would be that the judge would find out about that and you guys wouldn't know? If someone else submitted the report, if it came from somewhere other than us that's one way but I don't have I don't know specifically isn't it isn't it one of your duties the, your agency's duties to do a thorough and complete investigation yes okay. would you agree with me ma'am that a thorough and complete investigation would include getting other social workers reports of their investigations into the same allegations to yes form a foundation I'm sorry, your answer was? Yes. Okay. But you guys didn't do that here. Objective yes. foundation. foundation. Also assumes facts. Do you know whether or not you did a thorough and complete investigation here? Whether you actually called the witnesses to verify what they were saying? Objective. Join. Join. We did not call the witness statements. We were told that being military members and that they knew that they would be in trouble for lying, they were taken as fact. Who, who told you that? The Family Advocacy Office. Okay, so, you, so as part of your thorough and complete investigation, you didn't think it was, you didn't think it was necessary to actually get first-hand information from the witnesses? Checked for foundation argument. Join. We did not get in, we did not call them. Okay, and as part of your thorough and complete investigation, well, let me ask you this. By statute, you're actually required to do a thorough and complete investigation, right? That's, correct. That's correct? Correct. Okay, what does that entail when you say thorough and complete investigation? What does that mean? Objection overly broad. Go ahead. Getting the witness statements was obtaining information. Was it thorough and complete? Form argumentative. Join. In our opinion at the time, yes. Okay. What about getting the investigative report from Mr. Chidikamo and Masawa? Would that have been something that you would need to do to meet your obligation to have a thorough and complete investigation? Check the form foundation. Yes, and my recollection is we were waiting on that report. I had not seen it prior to, to this. That was one of the pieces we were waiting for. 
But we know that at least by June, the judge knew about it. Uh, so object, object form assumes facts, right? We know that he made a statement of a report. I'm assuming it was that report from Japan. On now, is there any reason you can think of why it would ever be appropriate to not include a prior licensed clinical social worker's report and assessments in your reporting to the court? Is there no. A, so it would never be appropriate to, to suppress that or exclude it? No. No, it would never be appropriate? No, it would not be appropriate. Okay. Is that something that could... Um, God, what's the word? Subject. Is that something that could subject the worker to discipline? For example, Ms. Wagner, who... who created the report, could it subject her to discipline if she knowingly failed to include the investigative report and assessments yes. prior to form for speculation? Would, would that be something that would subject Miss Wagner to discipline if she were found to have knowingly suppressed the Chidekamo report from Japan? If she knowingly suppressed it, yes. Okay. What about if she uh, just failed as part of her thorough and complete investigation to ever try to obtain it? Could that also potentially subject her to discipline? Check the foundation. If she failed to try to obtain it, yes, that could be subjected to discipline. What sort of discipline, if all, all she did, she didn't intentionally suppress anything, she just didn't call anybody, didn't make any effort to actually get the report, what kind of discipline could that subject her to? Calls for speculation, check. As a program manager that makes disciplinary recommendations as part of your job, what kind of discipline could that subject her to? There's different levels of discipline. There's letters of expectation. There's a memo of concern. There's placing a worker on a performance plan. Um, there's letters of reprimand. There's suspension. And the next level could be termination. Any of those things that you just mentioned, they were coming out too fast for me to write them down. Sorry. No, it's OK. It's all right. Any of those things that you just mentioned, did, to your knowledge, Ms. Wagner ever um, receive any of those forms of discipline in relation to this case, the Pellerin case? No. At any point in time, have uh, you done any investigation at all yourself to determine whether or not Ms. Wagner and her handling of this Pellerin matter met agency expectations? No. Have you directed any of your subordinates to undertake such an investigation? No. Do you know whether or not such an investigation has ever taken place with respect to Ms. Wagner's performance in the Pellerin matter? No. Okay. Has there ever been any mention of the need to do such an investigation? No. Is Ms. Wagner still one of your subordinates? Yes. Okay. What does she do now? What's her job? She's an investigative supervisor. How long has she been that? She came up right behind me, so April of 2000 and, what do we say, 15? I think so. Yes. Um, as part of her promotion process, was she, did she need to get recommendations? Mm, kind of. You, um, someone would have to go through the interview process and her um, employee packet would be looked at. Employee packet, what do you mean? Personnel what? packet. And what are you looking for when you look at that? Any kind of write-ups or discipline issues, performance issues. 
Did you participate at all in the review of her employee packet for this promotion? No, that's done by the management at regional office. Okay. How many subordinate investigators does Ms. Wagner oversee currently? Six. Well, you're her program manager, right? Yes. And part of your operational duties there, it's, I mean, you sort of need to know what your subordinates are up to, right? Yes. And then that includes knowing how many people they're managing, their caseload, things like that? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> now, when Ms. Wagner was looking to get this promotion, did you play any role in um, her obtaining that promotion? I believe I was part of the interview panel. Well, you were her direct supervisor, right? Right. How many people were on this interview panel? I don't remember. It's usually two to three. For how many years have you known Miss Wagner? Since she became an investigator, um, oh boy. It was 2007, sound about right? Uh, it seems later than that. I don't think, was she there then? I might be getting confused with a different worker in a different case. I don't know. Okay. I didn't figure it out from her, I suppose. Um, would it be more than uh, eight years? No, I'm thinking it's only like four to five years. Well, we know that 2013, when she first had her contact here with the Pellerin family, I mean, that's three, three, that's three years. years. I think I was her investigative soup for about two years, and then I've been her soup as a supervisor for almost two years. Okay. So like five to six, we'll get it figured out. That'll that's close enough. Do you, do you have any um, relationship with Miss Wagner outside of the workplace? No. You guys don't go out to dinner or hang out, anything like that. No. Okay. No, like swap meets on the weekend or. Nope. Thrift storing or. No. Nope. No. Nope. Okay. All right. I'm going to show you. We haven't done it yet, but I want to wrap it up so we don't have to deal with it next time. I'm going to show you what will mark as exhibit number B to your deposition. Yeah, let me put the sticker on. It's just a notice. Mm. Let me make sure that's the right one first. I'm sorry. Uh, request for. H-A-R-T. <laughs> okay, yeah, it's really hard. hard. <laughs> it's uh, Exhibit B. Sean, if you could just tell me what it is, I don't need to see it. Oh, uh, it's the original notice of deposition and request for production of documents. Yeah. And I don't know if you have a copy of it. If you don't, let me know because I probably have it on this drive and I can give you a yeah. copy when we're done. Okay. Just, have you seen that document before? I believe I have. Uh, when's the first time that you recall seeing it? Oh. Whenever this began. I don't know. I don't remember either. This says August of 2016. Let me see but if there's a something maybe I can refresh your recollection here with a does sometime around if you look here at the last page of the exhibit bottom of the page there's a date there next to the signature line yeah June 30th of 2016 does the re does that refresh your recollection as to when it was you recall first seeing this document you can give me a rough estimate. She doesn't have to sure. <laughs> okay. When you first saw the document, did you read it? I probably glanced through it. Yeah. Uh, yes. do, you, do you remember whether or not you understood it when you read it? Mm. Yes and no. I mean, it's obviously saying that it wants a production of documents. Um, 
so I know what that means, but I probably did talk about it. Okay. Um, let me see it real quick because that's my only copy at the moment. Looking at, let me get this out of my lap. Looking at page two under attachment A, specifically paragraph number three, where it says, uh, any and thank you, any and all documents that describe concern or constitute the training you received regarding AIDS's policies, practices, and procedures pertaining to a parent and child's constitutional right of familial association. First, did I read that correctly? Yes. And when you read it, did you understand it? Yes. Okay. And when you read it, did you understand that you had an obligation to conduct a reasonable or yeah, a diligent search and reasonable inquiry to locate documents responsive to the request? Yes. Did you undertake any effort to locate responsive documents? That is documents responsive to that request number three that I just read to you? Yes. Okay, what efforts? Um, we contacted our training unit, the person in charge of training, to go back through and see what they had on file for me as to this and many other documents requested. Okay, and with respect to that particular one, that is uh, documents pertaining to a parent and child's constitutional right of familial association, were you able to locate any responsive documents? I don't think so. Okay. Here, I'm just going to take this for number four. Okay, the next one, item number four, uh, I'll just read it and give sure. it back to you. It says, or request production of any and all documents that describe, concern, or constitute the training you received regarding AIDS's policies, practices, and procedures pertaining to the circumstances under which judicial authorization must be obtained prior to removing a child from the custody of its parents. That item number four, do you recall um, whether or not you undertook a diligent search and made reasonable inquiry to locate responsive documents? Yes, the same, same response, getting a hold of the people that manage all of our records to determine if they have that. Okay, and were you able to locate responsive documents? I, regarding that specific, I don't think so. Okay. Is one of the reasons that you weren't able to locate responsive documents, is it because there are no responsive documents, to your knowledge? To my sure. knowledge. And you don't specifically recall having had any um, training pertaining to the, the circumstances under which judicial authorization must be obtained prior to removing a child from the custody of its parents, correct? Did you perform the state's prior testimony? Asked and answered as well. Do you need the question we read? No, um, correct. Okay. okay, let's see the next one. I don't necessarily need it on all of these. Okay, number 10, it requests the production of any and all documents that describe, concern, or constitute the training and or education you received from aides pertaining to the requirement to be truthful, accurate, and complete in all reports and or documents filed with the juvenile court. That item number 10, did you undertake a diligent search and make reasonable inquiry to try to obtain responsive documents? Yes. Okay, and was it the same process as you described for me earlier? Yes. Were you able to locate any responsive documents? I 
I don't know. Um, I mean, I'm trying to think of what, where would it be written that specifically says you need to be truthful and accurate. It's understood, it's policy, but I don't know where there would be a document like quoting that. So when you, I when don't know how to answer that. Okay, when you say it's understood, it's policy, uh, do you mean to say that that is actually written in policy or that that's an expectation? It's an expectation and there's an ethical standard that comes along with social work of being truthful and accurate. There's an ethical standard. Is there a name or something that we tie to that ethical standard? I think it's under the social work standard of conduct. Social worker standard of conduct. Is there a document or something that uh, outlines those ethical standards? I believe there is. What's that called? I believe it's just what I told you. I think it's, there's a standard of conduct within social work. Have you ever heard the term NSWSC? Yeah, the National Social something, yeah. And as a matter of policy, is there a written policy somewhere that tells us that the state of Arizona, it's, it's uh, children's services workers, adheres to the National Social Worker Standard of Conduct? I believe there is something documented regarding that. I don't know if it's policy, but there, I know that when I have seen discipline forms, what some of the questions on it is about the standards of conduct. Well, when they're talking about standards of conduct, though, in your disciplinary forms, isn't that in reference to the Arizona state standards of conduct as expressed in the state's policies? There's Just that. Foreman Foundation, go ahead. There's that, but there's also about lying and being unethical. Okay. Now, when you say that there's something about lying and being unethical, or is that in the Arizona's state standards of conduct, or is that? I don't some, know. Okay. I, I don't know. Okay. But is your expectation as a program manager that your subordinate workers are going to be? truthful and accurate and honest in their in their interactions with the public and with the courts, right? Absolutely. What do you do to ensure that that actually, that expectation is applied in the field? You address concerns as they are brought to your attention. You, you're involved, you're staffing and talking and as you're having conversations with outside stakeholders such as attorneys or you know whatever you're you're, you're hearing they did a really good job or they didn't do a really good job mm -hmm. well let me ask you this now that you've heard in the opinion of one court that at least one of your workers wasn't credible is that something that you would be interested in going and investigating and potentially disciplining to enforce, to make sure that this expectation that you have of ethical conduct would actually be brought into practice in the field. Going. So it's the first time I've said this all day. Is that something I have to answer right now? If you know an answer, I mean, it's... Then I don't have an opinion today for that. Okay. Well you are going to have access to the full transcript of not only this deposition, but all these court proceedings. And um, maybe next time we talk, you can give me an opinion. With that, it's 5 o'clock. You guys want to call it? Yes, sir. Sure.